Hello, ladies and gentlemen of TH 110, Religious Faith in the Modern World. Here you see the PowerPoint, and let me go down to where I ended. I believe I was on that slide, excuse me, this slide with this picture. And I started out by talking about mystery and tremendous, and then I want to talk about fascinating. So. Uh, remember that this is the description given, the famous description given of the experience of the sacred by Rudolf Otto, that it is the Mysterium Tremendum. And I already talked about mystery and tremendous, as you see, tremo, tremo, tremui, I should say is the verb form here. Let's write this down for you. Trem, long O. And one of the past tenses is tremui, because it's, I think it's tremo, tremore, anyways. Means to shake, to quake, to quiver, to tremble. So we even have it in English. It's been taken over into English as to tremble. And what is the point? Why does Otto use this word? He uses it to express the idea that the numinous evokes a profound creaturely feeling in the human being. We feel that we are our full nature as creatures. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it comes from the word for being created, of course. We are created. We have a beginning. Whether we have an end or not is something else. Of course, if if we die, then we have an end, and there's nothing else after, then we have an end. But what if there is an afterlife and we go on forever, okay? But we certainly have a, a beginning. We certainly have a birth. Every, everyone on this planet has been born. Even Jesus, the Son of God, was born. He had a mother. So, this, uh, the phrase that uh, Otto uses to describe this experience of the tremendum is our feeling that in this creaturely experience is that we feel that we are dust and ashes dust and ashes um, and you know if you there's some biblical reference here because if you remember in the book of Genesis uh, God creates Adam the first man out of the earth out of the ground in fact Adam means if I remember correctly, means the ground. Let's just take a peek at that. Excuse me. If we go to our Bible here. And we go to the book of Genesis. Chapter 2, I believe it is. Genesis chapter 2, where God makes man... I'll make this a little bit larger so that we can see. Okay. And we go down to verse... Excuse me. Be nice if I could... There it is. Verse 7, chapter 2. The Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and gave him life. Now, if we go to our um, footnote in the Bible, which is, can really be helpful, um, you can see here that this word Gadam, meaning human being or man, is related to the word Adama, which means ground, earth. Okay? So that's, uh, you know, Otto was a Christian, if I remember correctly, and, and that's the point that he's making, that we... We experience our creatureliness when we encounter this, um, this experience of the numinous. And you can encounter it, I think, most directly during storms, speaking of today, which was a stormy day. But say if you're, uh, you know, if you live through a hurricane or a tornado or something like that, uh, some, or, or say an earthquake, I've lived through two of those. I've lived through an earthquake when I, I had made a trip out to Southern California back in the 90s. And uh, I've lived through several hurricanes, of course, living here in New Jersey over the years. Um, 
I'd say the earthquake was the one where I felt the most out of control. You know, with a hurricane, you can batten down the hatches, you can, um, you know, have candles and lights, you know, you can make sure that you're prepared to lose electricity, you can, uh, you know, make food for yourself, you know, you get sterno or something like that, you can still make some food if you have, I don't know, a computer. You can still hook it up, uh, you know, have it on battery and watch maybe a, a DVD or something. Even better, if you have a generator, you can still have electricity. Excuse me. Just drinking a little coffee. But with an earthquake, my experience of an earthquake, I remember I was in Southern California. I was visiting an, an abbey, uh, not of monks, but of, um, they're called canons regular, but I'm not going to get into explaining that because it would take too long. Nevertheless, the Abbey of St. Michael in, uh, I think, Orange County, just below, I think, below Los Angeles, yes. Anyways, and uh, I remember being shaken, literally shaken awake in the middle of the night by the earthquake. And it, f it felt like the whole building was just going, choo, 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 you know, side to side. Which, of course, it was. <laughs> it didn't just feel that way. It was. And it was the scariest thing because it, it's one of those experiences where, um, you know, or it was one of those experiences where I didn't know what to do. I know everyone tells you, well, if you're in an earthquake, you're supposed to stand in a doorway under the lintel or just get out of the building in case it collapses. And to be honest, I didn't know what to do. I was I was completely um, prone. I was completely motionless, except of course for the shaking of the earthquake. But I, I was inactive. I just didn't do anything. And then it stopped, and I went outside, and you could hear the sirens and and whatnot. Um, I felt my creaturely existence then, and there were tremors afterwards. Tremor, get it? Shake, shaking. Etc. Quivering, quaking, tremo, tremoe. Um, another experience I had, which you might say, well, that wasn't, that shouldn't be, should have been, shouldn't have been too bad, but it was. Um, I was at a seminary in Pennsylvania, and uh, there was a big storm that came through thunder and lightning, wind, and I thought I was going to be Mr. Brave, and I went out to the in, to the back of the building, and I'm standing up there on like a little knoll, looking up at these clouds, these huge dark clouds moving, you know, flying past in the wind, and um, the thunder and the rain, and I don't think it was that rainy, but it was certainly uh, very dark and ominous, and and I'm just standing there like, ah, I'm a brave man. I'm, I am man, you know? <laughs> I am man. I am going to stand up to you, Storm. And uh, within a few seconds, I just out of nowhere, all of a sudden, boom! This huge, huge um, sound of thunder that I could feel in my body and and from that moment, I went from being, you know, Mr. Man, who was going to show off in front of the storm, I'm not afraid of you, to being, you know, that little monkey, or primate, you know, running <laughs> into the caves, you know, wah, 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 you know, running for the caves to get out of the, you know, the scary sound, you know. And, yeah, I went back inside. <laughs> I felt my creatureliness. I felt like dust and ashes. There are times, especially I think in natural disasters, when um, it's almost as if the as if the cosmos reminds you of your place. Yes, we have the first place because we are created in the image and likeness of God, but as creatures, sometimes even just the natural elements remind us, "Hey, you know, look." If I could go all out on you, if I weren't controlled by the Lord God, you'd be in trouble, people. You know, and sometimes with natural disasters, that happens. Tidal waves, earthquakes, um, sinkholes, tornadoes, stuff like that. They remind us that with all our technology, 
we can feel safe inside our homes or our cars or wherever and we've got our phones and we feel safe you know you can turn the TV on and it seems like people are there in the house with you but they ain't you alone and the earthquakes bearing down on you and the earthquake has no conscience it doesn't know you're it doesn't care that you're created in the image and likeness of God it's just doing what it's, it does and uh, you feel that creatureliness how close you can come to death to ending your existence as it is so the numinous evokes that there there are and it doesn't have to be i mean otto is not talking about necessarily surviving a natural disaster but he thinks that there are experiences that humans have there are things that they go through um and it can be something as simple as realizing how immense the universe is Say, for example, um, you go outside one night and uh, you're in a place that's dark and you can actually see the sky or you can see the planets, you can see Venus by the sun, you can see Jupiter, the largest of the planets, you can see the red planet of Mars, okay? There, there are a few planets we can see with the naked eye. Um, you can see, of course, the sun. But think about where you are. You are on the crust of this, this rather small planet that is going around the sun. The sun is just a star. It's the name we've given to our star. And in fact, if you learn astronomy, they don't even call it the sun. They call it soul from the Latin word for sun. It's called soul. But anyways it's it's the sun you know and that star is one of trillions of stars throughout our galaxy and other galaxies but just stay with our own solar system we are around this star and we're going around it and all those other planets are going around it too and and then there's the beyond the darkness you see is the beyond the beyond other stars we can't see okay um, the rest of our galaxy and here we are and there's nothing above us there's nothing beneath us we are in a complete vacuum we're in a vacuum okay we are caught in uh, I think astrophysicists believe that you know the Sun is such a dense object that it creates kind of a, a warp a warp what's the what's the word i'm thinking of it kind of warps space and time around it space and time kind of gets warped around the sun and so it's almost like the sun is is sitting in the plane uh, of the galaxy and it kind of creates a little uh, almost um, indentation around it okay and we're kind of caught in that indentation kind of like uh, if you think about a water going around a drain it's not it's not a particularly apt analogy but maybe it will help you, you know that you have the Sun in the middle and it warps the space around it because it's so heavy that all the other planets were all kind of caught in this kind of um, downward um, move a downward um, angle of the warped space that the that uh, the sun creates uh, obviously an astronomer could explain this much better than I can um, but just thinking about these things you know that when you're out driving you you everything seems flat to you you're driving straight you're driving flat you're you know maybe you're going up and down through valleys and up mountains and stuff like that um, but really where we are we're at we're on the side of a planet you know, if you think about it, we're, we're walking on our sides. We're sitting on the side of a planet. Think of where New Jersey is on the globe. Okay. Um, stuff like that can make you feel your creatureliness. Your, one might say, insignificance in the world. Tininess. That's what Otto's getting at. You feel that dust, you have that dust and ashes feeling. You 
are in a way overwhelmed by your nothingness as well as your imperfection say for example your sinfulness in the presence of say God but generally um, as a common human experience because not all religions have the idea of sinfulness but as a general religious experience a supernatural experience you are overwhelmed by your nothingness in the face of the supreme capital S the supreme that which is seems entirely transcendent to you like the universe completely envelops you surrounds you and you are kind of alive at its control and this experience generates feelings of wonder and attachment wonder and attachment in in a simple word it fascinates you it fascinates us the Latin word fascino fascinere um, fascinui <laughs> uh, means to enchant to bewitch to charm okay and and you know to bewitch like to cast a spell on that's literally what fascinating means you you like you know you like for example let's say you see someone so beautiful you cannot look away from this person or you see something so beautiful you cannot look away you cannot or something you experience something that is just so fascinating you cannot stop thinking about it you keep coming back to it it fascinates you it enchants you it bewitches you and that's the third aspect that has been added to Otto's Mysterium Tremendum the Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans you'll sometimes see it as this way Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans the tremendous and fascinating mystery the experience of the numinous generates a sense of reliance a sense of reliance I need this you know I uh, this in some way gives life to me let's look at an example of the Mysterium Tremendum et Fascinans from the Bible here in Genesis let's look at the book of Isaiah the prophet Isaiah chapter 6 the book of Isaiah chapter 6 okay and I'll begin with verse 1 in the year King Uzziah died I saw the Lord I being Isaiah this is first person narrative I saw the Lord seated on a high and lofty throne with the train of his garment filling the temple seraphim were stationed above each of them had six wings with two they covered their faces with two they covered their feet and with two they hovered one cried out to the other holy 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 is the Lord of hosts all the earth is filled with his glory at the sound of that cry the frame of the door shook and the house was filled with smoke then I said woe is me I am doomed for I am a man of unclean lips living amongst a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King the Lord of hosts then one of the seraphim flew to me holding an ember which he had taken with tongs from the altar he touched my mouth with it see he said now that this has touched your lips your wickedness is removed your sin purged 
Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Here I am, I said. Send me. And he replied, Go and say to this people, Listen carefully, but do not understand. Look intently, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people sluggish, dull their ears and close their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and their heart understand, and they turn and be healed. How long, O Lord, I asked, and he replied, etc., etc., etc. Okay. That's, that's enough for my point. We are talking here about the, the, this famous passage from the book of Isaiah in which the prophet himself recounts his experience of God. God appears to him in the temple. From what we know of the prophet Isaiah, he was a priest who um, ministered, who served in the temple of God in Jerusalem. Uh, he mentions that because that's where his vision takes place. So he was in the temple. Um, notice that they didn't have calendars like we do today. I, at the beginning of this lecture, I told you today was July 24th, 2017. That's not how they did it in the old days. Okay, You would usually date things by major events. Um, but all, more times than not, you would date it by the name of the king or the ruler in, in whose area you lived. So here we can go to our footnote below and see they tell us in the year of King Uzziah when he died, probably around 742 BC, although the chronology of this period is disputed. Okay, so what that means is that Biblical scholars, we do have information about, actually a lot of information about who the kings of um, Israel and Judah were. Um, at this time, I believe uh, Israel was in existence. Well, I'm getting too deep into Jew is Israelite history, of, is, is the history of the kingdom, I should say. Anyways, um, Uzziah was the king of Judah, which was called the Southern Kingdom. There had been a split in the kingdoms of Israel. I said I didn't want to go into this, now I'm going into it. But anyways, if we look at a map, I actually have map here, just to, very quickly, very quickly, because this is not a course in the Old Testament, but you, you, might need, you really do need to know this to understand. Okay, uh, okay, that went too far. <laughs> uh, yeah, here we are. So that's Israel, modern day Israel, the country. There was a split in the kingdom. Okay, there was a split in the kingdom. In the southern part here with Jerusalem was called uh, Judah. Judah. And this part up here, the northern part was called Israel. Yes, that can be confusing, I know. And the capital was at um, Shechem. No, no. Was it Shechem or Samaria? Uh, I want to say Shechem. But anyways, it doesn't matter. As I said, it's not a course in Old Testament history. I'll look it up later for my own knowledge. But anyways, so King Uzziah had died. So that was probably around um, 742 BC, or at least, you know, in that arena, you know, the 700s BC, the 8th century. Um, so at this time, Isaiah sees a vision of God, the Lord, seated on a throne like a king like a king and as he said the train of his garment filled the temple so not only does God have a throne but he even is dressed like a king and the train of his garment is kind of like you know if you're wearing a long robe or a long um whatchamacallit not 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 a well robe but I'm thinking of something else here um A uh, cape. I think what I'm thinking of is a cape. Um, you know, God wears a long cape and the train of the garment, which would be like the edge of the cape that sometimes people will hold. It's kind of like with um, a, a woman who is a bride and is getting married. The train and people 
walk behind her bridal dress holding the train of her garment, which is the the back edge of the garment, and you hold it up so that it doesn't drag along the the um, the floor and get dirty. So God is wearing this long robe or this long cape that fills the whole temple. That's how huge it is, okay? So God is dressed like a ruler. Seraphim are angels. They're a type of angel. Uh, they're a type of it's the seraph, okay? And the plural is seraphim in Hebrew. So that's the plural. They could have just said seraphs, but they kept the Hebrew plural. And it's a type of angel. What are angels? These are creatures like us human beings, except that they do not have body. They do not have physical form. They are spiritual entities, okay? And their function is typically to act as messengers and servants of God and the belief according to the Catholic Church and, and to Christian belief. You find this, Jesus says this, that um, God has appointed certain angels even for every human being to protect us, to pray for us to God and to help us. Um, Jesus himself, when he's talking about little children at one point, he says, you know, don't you remember that they have angels in heaven that look upon the face of God? So by extrapolation and extension, you can assume that we all have angels because uh, I'm assuming we've all been children. <laughs> Jesus said they, the children haven't have them. Anyways, so there were seraphim, there were angels there uh, attending to God. They had six wings, six to cover each, well, six to cover the face and the feet and uh, to hover there. Why are they covering their face? Probably out of respect for the presence of God. And they're constantly yelling, crying out to each other in praise of God. Sacred, sacred, sacred is Yahweh of armies, is what that could literally be translated as, but also holy. Now think about that, because we're talking about Rudolf Otto, and what does he say is the essential experience of religion? It's the experience of the holy. And all throughout the Bible, God is described as the holy. He is the holy. And in fact, not only do they say holy once, they say it three times. So almost like perfection in a way. God is not just holy once. He is the all holy. Um, so you say it three times. And as a Christian, I, I think, um, you know, certain Christian interpreters in the past have also seen this as an affirmation of the threeness of God, the three persons of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All three are holy. Um, but, you know, that's theology, and uh, that's for another course. Um, so holy, right there, you find this affirmation, this proclamation by the angels that God is the sacred, and all the earth is filled with his glory. So when we're experiencing the numinous experience, according to scripture, we are experiencing God's glory, is what we're really doing. Okay? And at the sound of this cry, the frame of the door, I mean the door of the temple, to go into, there was a door to enter into the, the um, central portion of the temple where, where God was supposed to live. And the Jews really believed that. The Jews believed that God, God's presence was literally in the temple, that God kind of, that was his house, that was his home, he lived there. Okay, yes, God does not need homes or houses, but, you know, the people believe what they believe. And as, you, as it says, the frame of the door shook. Tremo, tremo we, yes. And the house, notice what they even call it. They call it the house, was filled with smoke. Okay? Calling it the house is interesting because if you look in other religions, calling the place where the God lived the house of the God, is not unusual, or the house of the goddess. This is not unusual, okay? Um, in this, religious language is being used as it was typically used amongst men and women in various cultures. So, for example, if you go to India, the temples are oftentimes built as mountain retreats, like chalets, you know, in Switzerland. You know, these, these homes that are built in the mountains because 
that's where the gods were believed to live. You know, there's this, and you find this all over the place. I mean, Mount Olympus in Greece, uh, for example, but people, uh, you know, Mount Fuji in Japan, uh, and the mountains of India, you know, the Himalayas and stuff like that. People associated said, you know, that's where the gods live. They live high up in the mountains. And so you would build the temple to resemble how a mountain house would look for the god. And they're called houses, you know, so nothing, there's nothing new under the sun here, okay? The Jews were not doing anything different. The, the only difference is that, of course, they're applying sacred terminology to the one true God, the one who really is God, Yahweh of hosts, the Lord of hosts. Now, what is Isaiah's feeling? Woe is me! I'm doomed! Now, we use that phrase to say, I'm doomed, but, you know, well, we really don't maybe know what it means, this word doom, to feel doom, okay? You know, you might know, well, it means, like, to feel bad, you know, it's not a positive word, I'm doomed, you know, like, something bad's gonna happen to me. Uh, no, it actually means worse than that. To doom something means to kill it something that is doomed, and this is religious language as well, to doom something is to kill it for a god, or let's say to kill it for a god, or slash, whoops, slash in a religious service, okay? To doom something meant that I am giving this totally to the god or the goddess, and because what I am giving is given totally, 100%, that thing has to be destroyed in some way, okay? If it's a living thing, then the ultimate destruction is to kill it, take its life, and to burn it up, okay? If it's not a living thing, like an animal, or in some cases a human being, but oftentimes animals, um, if, let's say, it is... Um, you know, the fruit of your work, like, you know, if you're a farmer, you bring grain, you bring vegetables, fruits, uh, all sorts of, you know, stuff like that, um, that is now doomed and being offered to the god or goddess, no one can eat that, no one can take that, that has to be burned, or it sits there and it rots, but it is completely given in a religious service to that deity, okay? It is doomed. Anything that is doomed, no one can possess. Not even the priests at the temple. It's not even for their use. It is for the gods' use. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, it, it, you know you'll see people in India or in places in Southeast Asia in, in some forms of Buddhism where they doom objects to the dead, okay? money, you know, they, they take paper and they make, you know, they, you know, it's, it's not real stuff, you know, they'll take paper and make little homes or houses, or they'll make what looks to like food. It's all made of paper. Okay. But it's like artwork and stuff like that. They'll take, um, pieces of paper and write on it so that it looks like, you know, money and stuff like that. All the things that maybe an ancestor might need in the afterlife, you know, Hey, you need a little coin, don't you? <laughs> You know, how are you going to take a taxi to, to, you know, to the promised land? <laughs> You'll have to walk, you know, but maybe your ancestor will make a little chariot with a horse out of paper for you, you know, and they throw it into the fire. It's destroyed. Why? Because it's doomed to the soul of your ancestor. Okay. So Isaiah thinks that he is now doomed. Why? He is going to die. He's going to cease existence. Why? Because he has seen God. And the belief was that no creature could see the numinous, could see the most sacred thing ever of anywhere, the Lord, the God, the God of Israel, and survive. You know, we, you're so creaturely, it overwhelms you to the point of you, you stop breathing and you die. I am doomed. However, God sends one of the seraphs to Isaiah who burns his lips with an ember, takes an ember from one of the, one of the coals of fire 
that were burning in the temple for incense offerings and stuff like that. Um, incense is just crystals, they're just crystals of perfume crystals and you throw them onto the fire and you know they should give off a, a pleasant smell. Um, I've, I've heard some scholarship to, the, to say that incense also has some you know maybe psychological effects on the brain of calming the brain or bringing it into other states of reality. I don't know enough about that to say but I've, I've read stuff to that effect, but whatever. Okay. Um, that doesn't surprise me. God uses whatever is going to be helpful to us to initiate a relationship. So, uh, the, the angel, the seraph touches Isaiah's lip with this burning coal and says, now you're cleansed. Be, uh, you know, you're okay. Now you can be in the presence of God and God then, then now God speaks, whom am I going to send to my people? And, Isaiah says, I will do it here. I'm the only one here, Lord. You know, I'll do it. If you're asking me to do it, you're sending me on a mission. Okay. But this is the great theophany. This, this, um, I wonder if I should have read that. But anyways, this experience of Isaiah in the temple is called a theophany. I have to write that down for you. It comes from two words, one of which you all, they're both Greek, one of which you already know, theos, plus, um, I believe it's phino, yeah. two Greek words. And what is a theophany? It's the appearance of a god. Theos, as you know, is god. Phino means to show forth. And we're back. I just took a very quick break. Um, just to find the Greek word to make sure that I was correct, phaino, uh, this Greek word. And I'm here on um, the Perseus project that they have at the University of Chicago. And it's a really excellent website. If you go to the Perseus project, they have all sorts of classical dictionaries and stuff. So here we are, phaino. If we go to the dictionary entry, I know there's a lot of information. You just, you know, ignore all of this. They're giving you sources. But if you go down to the end, go to A here, to bring to light, to cause to appear, but also to show forth, to display, okay? Just so you know, Mr. Dunn isn't a bobo. He knows his stuff, okay? So the showing forth of God. Fino means to show forth, to display, etc. and so forth. So the showing forth of God. And this experience of Isaiah, which is not unique, you find this in many religions, um, you find this experience of, of theophany, where a god, in this case, the god, I'm not saying other gods exist, people, I'm a Catholic theologian, okay? I'm a believer. Um, but in other religions, yes, gods, when they appear to human beings, these are called theophanies, theophanies. Okay, for, um, and here we have it here in Isaiah chapter 6. And just so I remember, so I don't forget, Isaiah the prophet lived um, from the 8th to the 7th century BC. Remember, we count down. Which is what? The 700s to the 600s BC, okay, um, is when Isaiah the prophet was alive, okay? All religion is based on this experience of the sacred in Otto's view, in, in the view of our buddy Rudolf Otto. All religion is based on this experience of das Heilige, the sacred or the holy. And from this experience of the sacred or the holy, humankind, through this experience by humankind, this is what, this experience is what gives rise to doctrines, teachings, customs, myths or scriptures, sacred writings, traditions and stories, rituals, etc., etc., etc. All the great diversity of human religions, all the things um, that you find in human religions, sacred writings, 
oral stories passed on, myths, stories about ancient times, um, rituals or ceremonies like sacrificing animals or off making offerings to the gods or goddesses, pilgrimages, traveling to sacred places and stuff like that, as well as teachings, you know, teachings about the universe, what's the point of life, where are we all going, you know, what is the universe made of, what are the gods, etc. and so forth. All these things for Otto are based on that experience, that essential experience of the numinous. It is the only thing that is essential to each and every thing called a religion, and without it, one does not have religion, in Otto's view. With, with, if you do not have the sacred, this numinous experience, this experience of the sacred, you do not have religion. Okay, so that is his view. Let us now move on to the next person, call a man named Mircea Eliadi, another famous scholar of religion. Um, I've sa always always said his name Mircea. Um, I've heard, uh, I've seen other places where it says it's pronounced Mircea. I'm going to go with Mircea. Um, I don't think Mircea, Mircea is correct, but I could be wrong. I don't speak Romanian. I'm not fluent in Romanian, and he was a Romanian scholar, and so you get, you know, whatever. So Mircea Eliadi, you can see his dates. He was born in 1907. He died in the late 80s in 1986. He was a Romanian from the country of Romania. He was a scholar. He was a novelist wrote books, nonfiction, I mean fiction, excuse me, not nonfiction, <laughs> not uh, fictional books. He was even a diplomat for, I guess, for his country of Romania. If you would like to see where Romania is, we go to Google Maps. And we just don't, ha we don't have to travel too far. There it is. The country of Romania is right here. It's on this huge body of water called the Black Sea. Okay, and uh, you can see who its neighbors are. I might have mentioned this in class, but I'll just mention it again. Romania fascinates me because it is the it it is a a, a um, Latin based language country. Okay, I've mentioned in class before about Spanish from the province of Hispania. You have Hispania where they spoke Spanish. Uh, or speak Spanish, the development, that's how Latin developed there, but you also have Portuguese, um, which d had its own history of development in, in Latin, uh, Italy, Sicily, France, okay, um, all speak Latin according to the form that it was spoken in those countries way back when, and also Romania, Romania, interesting. Um, it's interesting because the Romans were not in this area of the world for very long. Near the end of the Roman Empire, they conquered this area, which is called Dacia. I'm just, I'll just write it down so you know what I'm saying. I won't hold you to it, but Dacia or Dacia. And uh, they didn't stay there for very long, but they stayed long enough to leave their language. Okay, and, and even the name, if you look, Romania, the place of the Romans, okay? Anywho, um, let's see, what do I want to say? Okay, so our buddy Eliadi was a Romanian from that neck of the woods in the world. From, excuse me, 1956 until his death, Eliadi spent his years teaching at the University of Chicago Divinity School wrote down the date for you so you'll remember it 1956 until his death and uh, the University of Chicago uh, Divinity School actually its lineage is Baptist uh, although I don't think they're very um, um, I don't think th I think they let all sorts of people teach there and I, I think although their history is is in the Baptist tradition Baptist Christianity I don't think that they are tied to it that much um, 
Eliade is considered the founder of the Chicago School of Religious Studies. And this, uh, this uh, saying, the Chicago School of Religious Studies, Chicago School, also, it, when people say that, they also have in mind the History of Religions School or Comparative Religion Approach to the Study of Religion. Okay, and we'll understand what this means a little bit further, um, but I just want to pause here with... Um, with this uh, statement about the Chicago School. I had written something down, but maybe I didn't. Anyways, um, Eliade was a, a major, major figure in the um, not just really founding of the, the academic study of religion in America, but also its progression, its expansion throughout um, to other colleges and universities. Um, when, you know, that's why it's called, he's, he's, he's famous for starting this whole school, you know, it's like single-handedly at the University of Chicago. Um, his approach, his, the way he, he looked at and viewed religion, what it was, what it was meant to do. Um, when he came to America, there were maybe a handful of professorships and religious studies around the country. Um, by the time he retired, there were, you know, dozens and dozens and, and the, probably the majority or at least a significant portion of those holding the professorships and departments of religious studies had been taught by him. So he's very influential in his ideas. You will come across him quite a bit in religious studies, um, whether people want to agree or disagree with him. And there's a picture of the old dude with his pipe. <laughs> I love a man who smokes a pipe. I tried smoking a pipe for a little bit and uh, I just couldn't do it, you know. It hurt my teeth too much. Anyways, it, w it wasn't as cool as I thought it would be. Let's put it that way. Um, you know, you burn your hand. You know, you see this thing called the bowl where you put the tobacco. You know, you burn your hand. It gets very hot. And, uh, you know, you have to hold it sometimes in your mouth and okay, it can be quite uncomfortable anyways so this the Chicago School of Religious Studies also known as the history of religions or comparative religion approach um, which Eliade pioneered essentially looks at and compares what are considered to be quote-unquote timeless patterns in the religions he's looking for patterns um, for things that are repeated things that come up over and over again in the world's religions and don't just come up over and over again it's not enough that there's a pattern but I think for Eliade that pattern has to have a, a meaning to it that the meaning is pretty much always the same like I was talking before about calling a temple a house for a god that's a pattern building a house for your god okay for for your for the spirit that you want to to worship Okay, um, almost kind of capturing the numinous in this building. And so you can then, you know, almost putting it in prison in a way, imprisoning it. And then so that you can keep coming back to it whenever you want to, to make offerings or to talk to it or whatever. So patterns, uh, looking for patterns is the, I guess, the essential definition of the Chicago School. Here we have a list of some of his most famous works on religion, the sacred and the profane, cosmos and history, the myth of the eternal return, patterns in comparative religion. These are three books. Um, some taught, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Let's just start first with the, the sacred and the profane. Um, this is one of his most famous works. I give you the translations into English. I think these were all written in French, uh, but don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure Sacred and Profane was written in French, but translated into English. Um, the Sacred and the Profane is perhaps the best introduction to Eliade's thought. So if you want to just kind of know from the horse's mouth how he's viewing things, um, I would recommend that you start with the sacred and the profane. 
Nevertheless, there are other books that he wrote. Cosmos and History, The Myth of the Eternal Return. That is the title, but just uh, to give you a little heads up, um, oftentimes you'll just see it called The Myth of the Eternal Return, or at least I have. Um, more often than not, I've encountered it as The Myth of the Eternal Return, but really its, it's, it's title is Cosmos and History, The Myth of the Eternal Return, also translated into English, thank God. And some scholars think that Cosmos and History is probably his most crucial, meaning very important, and approachable short work. So apparently it's rather short and it's approachable. So if you want something maybe to pair with the sacred and the profane, Cosmos and History would be it. Or maybe you should start with that. And in giving this, this um, opinion, I am referring to a scholar called Bruce, Professor, excuse me, Bruce, Professor Brian Rennie, who is a professor at Westminster College in Pennsylvania. And Pencil, whoops, Pennsylvania. Um, he would recommend the, uh, the the Cosmos and History as as the most crucial and approachable short work of Eliade's books. Then we have his other book called Patterns in Comparative Religion. And finally, finally, kind of like Matt Friedrich Max Mueller, Max Mueller's ideas are probably not so much followed, well I shouldn't say probably, they're really not f very much followed amongst religious studies scholars, but remember the great claim to fame of Friedrich Max Mueller was the Sacred Books of the East um, this multi-volume work that he helped edit and helped bring into English translation um, many, many um, documents from Eastern religions. Uh, the same thing with Eliade. Although he did, you know, he did write books and articles, and so in these books and his theories are still relevant today. Um, but he also edited the massive 16-volume Encyclopedia of Religion. So, which which is a very good, very good. Um, thing to uh, consult. So you should know about that. What is Eliade's, what are his ideas, I should say? What, what, what did he teach? Well, for him, look, there's not much difference, okay? According to Eliade, we're talking about the sacred versus the profane. The sacred versus the profane. And according to um, Professor Brian Rennie, whom I mentioned just a moment ago, um, in his book, The Sacred and the Profane, the book, The Sacred and the Profane, Eliade, quote, picks up where Rudolf Otto's The Idea of the Holy left off. Okay, so clearly Eliade is following in the line of Otto's work, but he's adding his own originality to it. Okay. Um, for Eli Eliade seeks to explain the sacred through its relationship with, relationship to, and its relationship with its binary counterpart, the profane. Now, this idea of a binary means when you have two things in relationship to each other, okay? Um, you already know these words. The word bi means twice. I mean, if something is a biannual event, it means it happens every two years. However, if it's biennial, it means it happens twice a year. If you have bi-weekly meetings, it means that you meet every two weeks, okay? Bi-monthly, every two months, okay? You know this word. So when we talk about a binary, we talk about things, uh, usually things that are in opposition or come in twos. So, you know, good and evil. Okay, light, darkness, male, female. These are binaries that um, come in twos sometimes. For example, male and female, even though with the whole transgender movement, they're kind of blowing that binary all to hell. <laughs> and I don't know what we're going to be in the next 10 years. Um, but anyways... Uh, so, you know, binary. So yeah, I think you understand what I'm talking about. For 
for Ellie Addy, the binary, the religious binary was between the sacred and the profane, the sacred and the profane. And I'll talk about the profane in a moment. The sacred for Ellie Addy is whatever is not ordinary, whatever is not of this world. It's otherworldly. That is the sacred, okay? And the word uh, sacred, I don't want to come to that yet. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, the word sacred comes from Latin sacer, sacra, sacrum. The, uh, the adjective changes a little bit here. And uh, if you speak a language like Spanish, sagrado, almost exactly the same. Okay, very similar. Sagrado, la, oh, phew, nice if I could spell Spanish. Las Sagradas Escrituras, the sacred scriptures. If you're French, it's a little bit closer. Sacré, sacré. Okay. Um, in in Italian, you can just say sacro. It's it's clo It's the closest, and that makes sense because Italian is what Latin has uh, developed into. Excuse me, just a little coffee break there. So the sacred is whatever is not every day. It's not ordinary. It's not mundane, okay, to use a Latin word. This is worldly. But it, we could also say that the um, sacred is not what is mundane, if we want to use a Latin-based word. Mundum in Latin means world. Mundum, in the Latin mundum, mundum mundi, means world. So whatever is not worldly. Sacer, and, sacer, from which we get our word sacred, you'll see, literally means to be dedicated to a god or a spirit. Okay, so that's what sacred or holy means at its root. We use this word sacred or holy, but what does that mean? You know, what does it go back to? And what it goes back to is to indicate that whatever is sacred, a place, a building, a person, an object, a writing. What makes it holy is, what makes it sacer is that it is dedicated to a spirit, to a spiritual reality, dedicated to a God. Okay? Uh, the Bible is a sacred book. Why? Because it doesn't deal with philosophy. It doesn't deal with science. It doesn't deal with history. You will find phil philosophizing in the Bible. You will find history. You will find science. You'll find all these things, as well as in other religious texts throughout the world if you study them. But they're not geared towards that. That's not the reason for being. Okay? The, that's not why they're telling stories. The stories are related to the spirits or the gods, to what they're doing and how they interact with human beings. And that's what makes them different from just a run-of-the-mill history book or scientific textbook. You know, I to I've told you before in the course that uh, I told you this when I was talking about E.B. Tyler and his definition of, of religion, you know, the belief in spirits. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of these um, simple definitions, early definitions, are still very good ones. You know, I think that uh, um, Mueller is right that there is a, well, I, I think that Mueller had something about religion and language and the way we talk about things and, and words can sometimes affect our religious beliefs. Um, but I think especially E.B. Tyler was right that religion deals, what differentiates religion um, from other fields of study is that you're dealing with spiritual realities. Um, you're dealing the sacred, and, and as we come to Otto, the sacred. The sacred is something that is totally dedicated and pointed towards spiritual realities. Um, I didn't give you articles on this, but um, sometimes you'll, and maybe I should mention this in class again, um, religious, there's, there's a real debate that's been going on in religious studies for, it seems like 20 some years now, about what is religion. And for the most part, I think a, some, uh, for the most part, I think that 
religious studies people have kind of just thrown their hands up in the air and said, well, we don't know what religion is. You know, well, if you don't know what your field of study is, then why are we giving you money? <laughs> you know, why are you getting endowments from people to study this thing you don't know what it is? You know, why do you have religious studies departments? You know, why are you hiring people and paying salaries for people to teach something that they can't define? You know, that's essential to your area of study. I mean, an anthropologist knows what he or she is studying. An historian knows they can define what they're studying. A biologist can define what she's studying. You know, don't come to me and say, well, you know, I'm, I study religion. Oh, okay, what is that? Well, we really don't know. Well, then, then pump gas or something. Find another job, you know? I think one of the reasons, this is my personal opinion, um, and being someone, I'm not, a, I'm not degreed in religious studies. I'm a theologian, yes. I'm someone on the outside. But from looking on the inside, I think the problem um, that is really kind of not addressed is kind of just kind of just kind of um, overlooked I don't know why is that you're dealing with supernatural realities that people believe are real and people in religious studies some of them might be atheists some of them might be agnostics some of them might be believers in something maybe not intense believers in anything you know, they might have been brought up Christian or Jewish. Maybe they're not intensely, intensely involved. That's just the impression I get. You know, I, I haven't come across a lot of people like, I'm a born-again Christian, Jesus saves, and I'm also into religious studies, you know. <laughs> um, or, you know, I'm a devout Catholic. You know, I go to Mass every Sunday. You know, I fast during Lent. You know, I do all, I read the Bible, but... You know, and I also do religious studies. You know, I, I just haven't come across. I'm, I'm sure there are people who are doing it. I just haven't come across it, them. Nine times out of ten, I co I've come across religious studies scholars who are, you know, either not believers in a supernatural realm, um, or they um, are kind of colorless believers in some kind of religion, maybe Christianity. Um, but whatever they are, they don't want to make any value judgments on other religions. So, you know, they don't. Okay. The problem with that is that that's what religious studies is. Religion, you're, you're studying religion on its own terms. A biologist doesn't say, well, you know what? I want to do biology, but I, I don't really want to study living things. <laughs> Well, that's what biology is. Bios means it come, you know. Bios means a living thing in Greek. You know, if you're going to study, if your interest is religious studies, you have to accept that there is a belief in a supernatural realm that is real, that these spirits really exist, not just for these people, but for this religion, and you just can't have it any other way. And a lot of religious studies people seem to want to transform everything into, you know, Marxist interpretations or interpretations, you know, political interpretations or economic, the, the economic foundations of religion. No, none of them wants to, to address the fact that a religion might be based on a true, what these people believe is a true revelation from a deity or a spirit about what to do with their lives. They want to look for psychological angles. All everything's naturalistic, and they don't. And so they don't want to. You know, they want to say religion is that I study gods. I study the gods, basically. That's essentially what religious studies is. I study spirits. They don't want to be lumped together with parapsychology. You know, people who look for ghosts. You know, they want to be academically, um, academically respectable. Enough of my opinion. So that's what Sacher means. Um, as for, as prof this is a Professor Dale Tuggy, um, and I want to give credit to Dr. Dale Tuggy right now before I forget Professor Dale Tuggy. He teaches at the State University of New York in Fredonia, New York, excuse me, Tuggy, Dr. Dale Tuggy, State University of New York, Fredonia campus. 
and he has a really great um a really great site on uh religious studies and i've truly benefited from videos that he's made in fact I'll, i'm going to show it to you i have it uh i subscribe to him on my my youtube channel i want to give you his address Okay, there we go. We load. There we Let's see if he has anything new on here. Podcast. No, I don't. I don't think so. But anyways, um, go to his videos. Okay, here we go. Um, Oh, he's been active. Okay, so he talks about the Trinity and all sorts of stuff. But um, he's really got excellent, excellent videos on other religions. He's got tons of videos here, as you can see. So I'm just going to give you the address of his channel here so you can uh, look at it later. There's his channel, or maybe if you want to highlight it or write it down. Okay, there's his channel. It's excellent. And I have relied on his videos... Um, in regards to these thinkers. So I just want you to know, not only have I contributed my own thoughts, so what I'm doing is original, but I, I, I definitely took a lot of notes from the videos he had on all of these great thinkers. And I haven't even included all of them. I've just selected from some of his videos. So Dr. Dale Tuggy. So anyways, Dr. Tuggy believes that um, this definition of the sacred by Eliade uh, is not so much a definition of what it is as of, quote, what it ain't, okay? Whatever is not profane, whatever is not worldly, you know, not, okay? It's more of a definition of what the sacred isn't than what it is. So it's more of a negative definition than a positive definition. What is the sacred, okay? What is this thing? Um, with Otto, you get, you know, I think a, a positive definition of this, an ex, uh, you know, even, you know, Otto even gives you some of the physical experience of tremoring, shaking, you know, shaking somebody to their, to their very core so that they feel their creatureliness, you know. But with Eliade, this is kind of very, very theoretical. It's just whatever is not ordinary. Well, that could be anything. That could be any experience. So Tuggy offers a criticism here that I think is, is valid. And yet, I would, in De Eliade's defense, sometimes you can only define things by what they aren't. You know, that happens, I think. What is the profane for, well, you're going to like this. <laughs> what is the profane for Eliade? Well, that which is not the sacred. So... So, very easy definitions to know. The, pro, the sacred is that which is not worldly, that which is otherworldly. You know, it's not normal. The profane, whatever's not sacred. So, I guess whatever is normal would be the profane. And in point of fact, as you can see on the PowerPoint slide, in point of fact, um, Eliade is actually just giving us the definition, which is a really old definition of the profane. Uh, it goes all the way back um, to this man Plautus, you see at the bottom here, my buddy Plautus. He died around 184 BC. I should make that little correction, put a little space there. Who was Plautus? Well, he was, he was a playwright. He was a comedic playwright. Um, or a comedian, if you want to say. But he, he wrote funny plays, okay? Um, I'm not sure if I read Plautus's plays that I would uh, find them very funny, because I'm not sure if ancient humor would translate to the modern world. Um, but whatever. Plautus was a comedic playwright, okay? I'm going to go down here, so I'll write this down. A comedic playwright, and in... One of his plays, I'd have to look it up, I don't, I don't know, I didn't write it down. In one of his plays, he defines um, the profane. The profane is that which is not sacred. That's, you know, exactly the same as uh, Eliade's definition. And maybe this was a joke on Plautus's part. Maybe he was making a joke. Um, and Eliade just kind of missed the humor here. 
because you got to remember, Plautus is a funny guy, you know. What is the profane? Ah, it's not sacred, you know. Oh, well, that tells me nothing, Plautus. Well, that's supposed to tell you nothing. He's being ironic. So maybe Eliade has kind of missed the irony here. But if we take the word profane, let's see what that help, what, what that gives us, okay? Um, if we break it down, in Latin, the word profane comes from two words, pro and fanum, which literally means before or in front of the temple or before or in front of the sanctuary, okay? So let me find a picture here. Let me uh, go to Google. Because um, temples, temples were usually built in stereotypical ways, okay? Um, you know what? Let me find you um, a, a picture of the Jerusalem temple. Let's keep this Judeo-Christian. Jerusalem temple, images... Okay, now the Jerusalem temple does not exist anymore. It was destroyed a long, long time ago. I want to find something that is, uh, okay, that's, that's a pretty good picture. We'll use this. Uh, come on, can we just see the picture, please? Nope, I don't want that. Let's do this, view image. Okay, here's the image. Um, this is a, a model of ancient Jerusalem, but also the ancient Jerusalem temple, which was destroyed in 70 AD. This very famous date in the history of Christianity and Judaism. 70 AD, this structure was destroyed by the Romans. Now, this is how the temple was built. And this is stereotypical of a lot of temples, and uh, you'll find this in the ancient world. Let's start from the, the uh, inside first. Here is the house of God. Okay, notice the door. Okay, these are the doors um, that uh, Isaiah 6 was talking about. And this is properly the house. And inside this house is where God lives. And so this is the court of the men and the priests. So here is where you would find the offering. You know, the priests would be moving around here. You would have sacrifices here, offering of incense. Honestly, to me, this looks rather small and narrow. I don't know how they managed all the, the services um, that were required, but whatever, okay? Outside of this, this squarish area, you come to what is called the court of the women. Okay, the court of the women. So Jewish women were allowed to enter into this court, but no further, no farther, I should say. They could not enter through this door or these entries into the court of the Israelites, the court of Israel, the men. Yes, it sounds sexist because weren't the women Israelites too? Yes, they were, but women, you'll find out very quickly in a lot of religions, women, are trouble. <laughs> women are troublemakers. <laughs> Whenever it comes to women, there are always a lot of rules for things that women can't do. And I hate to say it, but Judaism was no different. Uh, in some ways, Christianity as well. So I'm not casting stones, but it was just the case that the Lord God said, you know, in designing the temple, men could come in all the way. Only the priests, though, were allowed into the house. And even into the, the even into the inner chamber of God's house, the high priest was only allowed. But anyways, um, so this was the court of the women. And out here, this huge court was called the court of the nations, the court of the Gentiles. Okay, and you can see the, these areas, these columns, these colonnades. These are all walking areas, and rabbis and teachers would sit in these areas, particular areas. And uh, they would teach in the temple, they would teach their students, etc. and so forth, and stuff like that. Jesus did this. We, we know that Jesus did this, because in some of the stories it talks about Jesus walking around the temple, and places he was, he was in the temple, etc. and so forth. Um, okay, so, this would be the temple. This was the temple structure. 
Now, why am I telling you this? Oh, <laughs> I mean, you notice that the closer you get to the temple, the more sacred it becomes, the more dedicated to the god it becomes. Okay, out here, the court of the nations, technically part of the temple structure, okay, but anybody could be here, Jew, non-Jew, whatever. You could, you could approach, but no farther, okay? No one who is not a Jew could not, could enter, excuse me, no one who is not a Jew could enter into this area. This is where you, it became so sacred, so holy, so dedicated to the God of the Jews that only a Jew could enter. If you tried to enter and you were not a Jew, the temple guards were, would kill you on the spot. And in fact, they had signs saying to that effect. They said signs that said, "No one, you're not a Jew. You're not allowed past this point. If you come past this point and you're not a Jew, you will only have yourself to blame for your speedy death." <laughs> so they made it very clear. Okay, and we found some of these signs um, etched in stone from from that from the temple area. So. Um, and this is the same for a lot of religions, okay? For example, in Islam, a non-Muslim may not enter the sacred city of Mecca. You just can't. You're not allowed. You have to be a Muslim. No non-sacred feet may walk on the soil of Mecca. Um, in, uh, excuse me, a little coffee break. You see that there are things that can that go on outside of the temple that are not permitted, or the sacred space, I should say, that are not permitted within the sacred space. So that's what we're getting at with this idea of the profanum and being profane. The worldly things, buying, selling, um, hanging out, okay, um, you know, transacting business, which I already mentioned. Um, working, all these things are acceptable outside the sacred space, okay? They are all acceptable, um, but not within the sacred space, okay? They, those are activities that are pro fanum, that can happen outside the sanctuary, but are not supposed to happen inside the sanctuary. You might recall, you might recall, and maybe I'll show it to you, let's see if I can, um, an incident in the temple. You might recall an incident Jesus had in the temple of Jerusalem because he thought that the sacred space was being defiled by profane activity. And let's take a look at that. You cannot buy anything in the temple for Roman money. You must change it for our shekels. You know that. Good, and it's cheap. But if you don't like it, I'll show you another problem. We're turning the house of our lord into a marketplace. It's a shame. Pick and mark. Okay. At the same rate as all the other stores, my friend. It comes to ten shekels and a half. Take two instead of one. The lord will be grateful. Two fine lambs. Two fine lambs. I did this trick to make it fine. Money and preach somewhere else. Jerusalem! The faithful city! She that was full of justice has become a harlot! Stop me! I did not know! I did not hurt! Turn! Has it not been told you from the beginning? Stand. What are your multitude of sacrifices to me, says the Lord? Bring forth no more pain offerings! Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Blessed, blessed Jesus. Jesus is a, a Jew and he is 
righteously angry that in the midst of the sacred space of the temple, these merchants, these businessmen have been allowed to set up their shops, to sell animals, to change money. And, you know, you have to understand a little bit of the history, uh, a little bit of the background of this. Um, the money changers, what they were, why did you have to change your money? Because, as I, again, this is the idea of the sacred. The temple, you could not use Roman money. Because the Roman, of course, you're using silver and gold and bronze and all other cheap metals for the lesser coins onto which people had physically stamped or imprinted information. So, for example, you know, the reign of Caesar, whatever, you know, so they would stamp the image of the, the Roman emperor onto the coin, and on the other side of the coin they might stamp on an image of one of their gods, the gods of Rome, various gods. Or maybe a god that the Roman emperor was particularly devoted to or something like that. Now, remember, God, the, the God of Israel, the Jewish God, says right in, in the first commandment, after he says, he reminds the Jews, I am the Lord who brought you out of slavery from Egypt. He reminds them who he is. And... Because I am the Lord, I do not want you to make any images. Do not make any idols or statues of anything on earth, under the earth, in the skies. Okay, um, Do not imitate the nations that make idols. And just about every, in every culture on the earth, we have idols. Just about every. I mean, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but I would say there are exceptions that prove the rule. But, you know, of drawing pictures or making statuary or carving wood into the shape of, some, of what someone thinks some spirit looks like. Um, and the Jews, as far as we know, were unique in that their God told them, do not do this. Now, the Jews didn't follow it. <laughs> You know, you know, if you read, if you read, for example, the prophet Isaiah, one of the things the prophet Isaiah rails against and go, it drives him insane is that the, the people of Jerusalem still have idols. They still, you know, they worship God in the temple, but, you know, they might have a little idol of something at home, you know, a little statue or something that they offer prayers to as well. You know, they were, they were faithless. And God was fed up with it. And he sent Isaiah the prophet to tell them, stop doing this. I told you not to do this. Um, but they still did it. Okay? So part of um, being a Jew was to avoid idols and images, especially of false gods. But of any, usually this extended to anything, even human beings. Um, and again, you know, the Roman emperor was considered semi-divine, having some sort of divine status, having been adopted by the gods. So there was a problem even with the image of the emperor on the coin. And so these coins were not permitted into the temple. They were not permitted into this sacred space. If you wanted to come into the temple to buy animals, to buy doves, to buy goats and sheep that would be sacrificed in the temple or to make an offering to the temple, you know, give alms to the poor, or whatever, um, you had to exchange it for shekels that did not have images on them, didn't have false images. Um, and so that's what the people are doing in the movie. The problem was that a lot of times the exchange rates were in the, uh, let's say, the best interest of the uh, businessman than of the person coming to the temple. Uh, so you might, you know, come with, I don't know, 50 gold pieces and you find out that your 50 gold pieces are only worth a few shekels. So, you know, essentially they were screwing people. They, they, were, they were making money for themselves um, and uh, they were kind of um, defrauding people on the exchange rate. Um, 
And so, you know, I don't know about the animals. The animals is another issue. I don't know if the animals were unclean or what the problem was with the animals, um, if they were not appropriate for that area. But whatever, this pisses Jesus off because this, this drives him in one of his few moments where Jesus actually does violence. Jesus takes a whip and starts whipping the animals out. Jesus takes, starts overturning people's tables and smashing things, okay, with his disciples. He starts doing this and screaming, you know, screaming. He's quoting scripture. My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus is quoting scripture there. And in point of fact, Jesus, if we look, we will see that Jesus is quoting the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 56. Let's go to it. Isaiah chapter 56. Okay. Thus says Yahweh, thus says the Lord, Observe what is right, do what is just, for my salvation is about to come, my justice is about to be revealed. Happy is the one who does this, whoever holds fast to it, keeping the Sabbath without profaning it, keeping one's hand from doing any evil. Now, what does it mean, keeping the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week, without profaning it? It means that on the seventh day of the week, as God says in the Ten Commandments, to keep holy the Sabbath day, it means that you do not do what you would normally do. What would you do on a normal day? Like Eliade, Eliade would say, what would you do on a normal day? A normal day, a profane day. Work, okay, travel, house cleaning. All sorts of stuff, okay? Do your job you know, on a normal day. Go to the store to buy things. But on the seventh day, the Lord says, it is sacred to me. What does that mean? That you do what is not worldly, what is not normal. So you do everything that's not normal. You don't work. You don't go out shopping. You don't clean the house. What do you, what's there left to do then? Rest. Rest. Do nothing. Rest. Relax. And that's precisely what the Lord tells his people to do. Rest. Don't do any servile work. Okay? Keep yourselves away from what is, what is worldly on that day. Why? To remember what is not worldly. God. So pray. Read the scriptures. Remind, you know, reconnect with the Lord. Use that day. Not that you shouldn't be doing those things on the other days. You know, that you can pray and read the Bible on other days. But this day has been chosen by the Lord God, the God of Israel, as a sacred day, sacred day of the week. So don't profane it. Don't treat it as a normal day. Don't think, oh, you know, I can get some things done for school today. No! That's why Mr. Dunn I know I sent you an email last night, which was a Sunday, um, but I had to. I mean, it was an emergency situation. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't let it go. All right. So I, in conscience, I don't feel badly about that. But typically, I will not, I will not address anything having to do with my work on Sunday. No emails, nothing. No readings, nothing. I relax. I look at stuff, you know, enjoy myself. You know, I go to church, you know, I relax, I rest. Um, because I don't want to profane the Sabbath. Um, there's something else I wanted to tell you. Um, now I can't remember it. Oh, I wanted to write this down for you. Isaiah chapter 56. Jesus is quoting from there. Actually, he's quoting verse 7. The foreigner joined the... the jo the foreigner who is joined to the Lord should not say, the Lord will surely exclude. Okay, we can go down, I'll go down here. I don't need to worry about that. Okay. Them, and he's talking about, um, well, maybe you need this for context. 
um, about people. Okay, the foreigner who, who is joined to the Lord should not say, the Lord will surely exclude me from, the, from his people. Nor should the eunuch say, see, behold, I am a dry tree. Now, what does that mean? A eunuch with someone, well, I mean, there's no way of getting around it. A eunuch with someone whose testicles had been either crushed or cut off. Um, yes, not a very pleasant experience, but, you know, the scrotum of the man was taken and it was either cut off um, from his penis or the scrotum was smashed, crushed to destroy the testes. Why? Um, because eunuchs were usually used in governments as servants to women, servants in the court of the ruler, and one, one way to cause a lot of trouble in the court of a ruler was to be diddling around with the princesses and or, and, or the queen, you know, and uh, getting the princesses pregnant or, you know, a eunuch, uh, messing around having sexual relations with the queen and getting her pregnant um so eunuchs were cat in a sense really castrated so that they they could not um how shall we say this promote their seed <laughs> in a way so that's why the eunuch says i am a dry tree you know i i, I can't procreate i can't make any other trees for thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, and who will hold fast to my covenant, my agreement with Israel, I will give them in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. An eternal name which shall not be cut off will I give them. Now think about that. You know, God is allowing eunuchs who actually were not allowed to enter into the temple because they had um, disabled themselves or they had allowed themselves to be disabled. They were not allowed. No one who was disabled was allowed to enter the temple. Okay? Remember, it's a sacred space. Nothing, you know, nothing, um, well, bad was considered an evil was allowed to enter, just as nothing that was profane. So a cripple, a leper, someone who is mentally retarded, um, in this case a eunuch, someone who um, had had his, has been castrated, they, they were not even allowed to em enter the temple. But here, through Isaiah, God is talking about a time where even the eunuch who is faithful to me will be allowed into the temple. And foreigners, Gentiles who join themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to become his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without profaning it and hold fast to my covenant or agreement with Israel, them will I bring to my holy mountain, meaning the temple, because it was built on a, well, it's, a, it's really just a big hill, but they call it a mountain. My holy mountain, them I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, their holocausts, and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Okay, well that's where Jesus gets it from. Now, the second part of what Jesus says actually comes from another prophet named Jeremiah, chapter 7. Jeremiah, chapter 7, and I think it's verse, verses 9 through 10. That's, whoops, 9 through 10. Jesus uh, combines these verses, okay, which was not unusual and how people would quote from the scriptures. You find this a lot in Jesus' preaching, in the letters of Paul, who was a rabbi, and um, where, you know, two, two disparate um, thoughts are brought together to create one, or I should say two disparate scriptures. Two um, citations are brought together to bring it into one thought. So here... Um, do you think, this is 
verse 9, do you think you can steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, sacrifice to Baal, follow other gods that you do not know, and then come and stand in my presence in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe, we can commit all these abominations again. Has this house which bears my name become in your eyes a den of thieves? I have seen it for myself. Oracle of the Lord. Or actually, it's thus, it's thus says the Lord. Okay. Okay, so it's uh, 9 to 11. Excuse me. So the Lord is in his prophet Jeremiah. This is the temple sermon, famous, the famous temple sermon where Jeremiah is sent by God to go to the temple and to preach the word of God to the people who are there. And it's a very uh, shocking and disruptive sermon because essentially uh, Jeremiah warns them. He says, you know, you think that because God is present amongst you that you're safe. And because you're safe, because you have um, the temple here, that you can do all the things that God forbids and then just kind of run back to the temple and say, you know, here I am, Lord, I'm, I'm your follower. Well, remember, that, and, and Jeremiah essentially threatens to have the temple destroyed, which was almost like if today, if I sent out an email to you, to all of you, or something where I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill the president and overthrow the government. Essentially, Jeremiah is saying to his fellow Jews, no more. The Lord will destroy this temple. He will destroy this house. It's his because you have been unfaithful. So, interesting. Uh, you know, I could spend maybe another couple hours just trying to think about why why Jesus would bring these two very these two texts together in, in a very these two texts these two prophecies these two statements that are given in very different contexts and then applies them to the context of the Jerusalem temple he saw um, but whatever it was it made Jesus angry they were profaning what was sacred what they were doing in their business dealings and somehow somehow in how they were treating the animals I don't know um, that made Jesus angry And he says, this is a house of prayer. This is a special place. This is supposed to be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a, a place of evildoers, you know, a den of thieves. You're stealing from people. You're committing sin right in the presence of God. Right in the presence of God. So that's what makes Jesus angry. Hold on a second. The cat wants to go out, go out of the room. Ah, hold on. I gotta open the door for her. Go. Okay. She'll be back crying, though. She'll want to come back in the room. So, what was done in... He, they were doing things that should not have been done um, in this sacred space. And so I give this to you as an example of the profane. For Eliade, the sacred and the profane are, quote, and I believe I'm getting this quotation from Tuggy here, they are modes of being in the world. And this, this statement, you know, being in the world is all hyphenated. Being in the world. Okay? Existing in the world. Okay? Um, why is there a hyphen? Because each, it, it's meant as a, as a, a singular phrase okay my being in the world rather than being in the world if you understand what i'm saying okay so the sacred and profane are modes of this um existential quality we might say so they're binaries as i as i pointed out to you earlier they're binaries okay they go together uh, they're not opposites necessarily, but they, they're, they're binaries. They're two things that go together, the sacred and the profane. 
and there are ways that people exist in the world. In, in the profane world, you um, act in a certain way that you, you do not act in the sacred. At least you're not supposed to. Although I was at Mass on Sunday and, you know, I saw people who had come to church in um, flip-flops, you know, in sandals. Um, I had a, a young man in front of me who was wearing a t-shirt and shorts to come to Mass, to come to see God and pray to God and to receive the body and blood of Christ. Now, I don't judge him. Um, I don't know the state of his soul. I can't read his heart. As for all I know, that young man is a saint. He's, he's a truly holy and good person. I don't know. I will assume that he's a good person. Um, also, you can't tell nowadays what goes on in people's minds because we're, we're so enculturated. Um, people do things and say things and wear things and it doesn't even occur to them that they might be inappropriate just because they see them and hear them all the time on television. All the time. You know, and they, so they think it's appropriate. They hear it all the time. And so they just don't, they hear it on TV, they hear it on the radio, they see it on the internet, they hear it amongst their friends and their conversations. It means nothing to them. So there are, for some people, you know, it, you know, this, this distinction or this difference between the sacred and the profane doesn't matter anymore. And to be honest, in a lot of, uh, the modern world, we've gotten rid of these, this distinction. Um, and in, the, especially in the Catholic church, I mean, the Catholic church has spent the last 40 to 50 years scrubbing and tearing and ripping, you know, scrubbing away and tearing up and ripping apart just like just about anything that might give you a sense of the sacred in churches. I mean, if you look at a Catholic church from 100 years ago or 500 years ago, or if you look online, sometimes you can see this. If you look online, you know, search for Roman Catholic Mass I don't know, 1940, you know, something like that, you know, and see what you get. And you'll probably get some, you know, black and white video or something and see how the, the mass was for Catholics, you know, almost 80 years ago. Um, you know, it was very different. And um, there were parts of the church that a, a regular person a profane person, one might say, were not supposed to go into, like the sanctuary. Um, there were things you could not touch, only a priest or a deacon could touch. Why? Because they were sacred persons, and you were not. Um, all sorts of things. Also, And some of these things, you know, still exist. For example, if you go to foreign countries and try to enter certain sacred sites, mosques, stuff like that, um, women especially will be turned away. A lot of women, Western women, will, will ha get a great wake-up call because a lot of Western women, just without thinking about it, are not dressed appropriately. You know, women um, walk around in t-shirts, sometimes with their shoulders uncovered. They walk around in shorts. Sometimes the shorts go right up to the crotch. They go, they go right up to the crotch. They might as well be wearing underwear. And if you tried to enter, a, first of all, if you tried to enter a mosque, even in the United States, a lot of mosques would say, you can't come in to a woman like that, dressed like that. You are not dressed appropriately for this sacred space. Certainly, if you went to the Middle East, even walking down the street, you might get some comments from some of the men um, about how you're dressed because you're not dressed appropriately okay 
Um, but even more so for a mosque or a church. Like if you went to Jerusalem and tried to go to some of the churches or the mosques, they'd never let you in dressed like that. You have to have your legs fully covered, your arms fully covered. And this goes for men too. You know, men, can, but it's less, men have less things to cover up than apparently women do, you know. And in some places you would be forced to cover your head if you were a woman. Or they simply would not let you in. It's a sacred space. And it's different from other space. So for Eliade, the sacred and the profane are two different outlooks. They are two different ways of approaching life. And to quote from Eliade, the sacred and the profane are two existential situations assumed by man in the course of history. And I'll write that down for you so you can remember it. The sacred and the profane are two existential, as you describe, situations assumed, taken up by man, assumed by man in the course of history. And that's how man chooses to look at the world. Now I mentioned to you the fact that for a lot of the Western world, human beings have decided to no longer look at the world through the sacred. We look at it pretty much through the profane. Um, that's our existential situation. Nothing is sacred. There is no special space. Science has taught us that there's just energy and matter, time and space. There's nothing supernatural, so we just pretty much act as if we're materialists. Everything is simply matter until it's converted into energy. Um, and that's how we kind of look at life. So, as I was just mentioning a moment ago about Roman Catholicism, there's been a great loss of this sense of holiness when it comes to religion. Um, and that's been lost in, I think, a large part of Christianity, to be honest with you. Not just Catholic, but even Protestant. And I think it kind of is holding on in Eastern Orthodox Christianity, um, but I think once any form of religion starts to um, become part of the West, starts to be enculturated with Western ideas, it starts losing it. And I think that's, you know, that happens to Islam as well. You know, even people are worried about Islam um, in Europe and uh, Islam here in the United States. But to be honest with you, American Muslims, even those who are Western, uh, maybe it's been a harder, in, uh, a harder uh, project to incorporate um, people uh, into the European culture because there are so many of them and they really are different. Um, and they're still different countries. I mean, they can say they're the European Union all they want, um, but people still seem to identify more with their country. Um, they've had a harder time of in, in integrating people than I think we have had in the United States. Uh, and by, you know, people come over here and, you know, their children and certainly their grandchildren, by the time of their grandchildren, definitely, I would say, they're Americans. And they don't look at Islam in the same way as their parents do or their grandparents back in the home country do, you know, in Iran. You know, the way they, they practice Islam in Jersey City is different than the way it's practiced in Tehran, okay? Uh, you know, women, Muslim, and you can see it here in, you know, can see it on campus with women who would say they're Muslim, but they don't wear the veil. You know, it's it seems to be, and I've been told by these women that it's kind of uh, a choice. It's really not a choice. It's actually if if you're a if you believe in the sacred, as proposed by Islam, 
And if they go to any Muslim country, serious Muslim country, Saudi Arabia, Iran, um, even places like maybe Jordan, uh, which you might think are more tolerant, or Oman, uh, I think that as a Muslima, as a Muslim woman, they're going to be asked to wear veils. And certainly every time they enter a mosque, a place of prayer, they have to put on a veil. They, these women, I know they're telling me that, you know, it's a choice, but once they get to the mosque, it's not a choice anymore. You're, you put on a veil or you get out. <laughs> you're not, you're not allowed to pray there. Now, there might be some more liberal mosques that don't care, but that's a development in Islam. That's not, I think, true to Islam. That would be more of a Western development in Islam, but I think most mosques you go to, they're going to make it very clear to any woman that uh, they don't care if you were born in Jersey City or Hoboken or whatever and raised here. You wearing a you wearing a veil when you come into the mosque, you know the mosque, baby. So for what is the holy? Uh, we have we've had his definition of what the holy is. Um, the holy is what's not normal. Uh, but for a further explanation, you can't just leave it there. As Tuggy said, it's just this definition is more of what the holy ain't than what it is. So what is the holy for Eliade? For holy, for Eliade, excuse me, um, the holy is the equivalent of power. It's the equivalent of reality, of being slash existence. So true being or true power one might say, is true existence. You know, you have this experience of, I guess, truly being alive. It makes you really feel your aliveness as a creature. It, there's a sense of power either coming from you or coming into you. And that, you know, honestly, I gotta, you know, that's not the best definition I guess because it's very subjective what does that mean you know it's not it's not quantifiable and uh, maybe that's why religious studies scholars have such a problem with saying what religion is because you know you can't really qualify you can't point to it and say ah that's the holy that powerful thing there that's the holy you know it's more philosophical you know I, I have a sense of being I have this experience of existence and that's the sacred. Hmm. The problem with that is that not everyone feels that way. You know, if you're a biologist and you study ducks, well, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, if it's a duck from Japan, it's a duck from Nigeria, it's a duck from Argentina, it's a duck from Canada. A duck is a duck is a duck. You know, <laughs> different species of ducks, but they're ducks. You know? And uh, you've got to be able to, you know, to give some respectability to this. You've got to be able to point to, okay, this religion in Australia shares this with a religion in Botswana, shares this with a religion in Ecuador, et cetera, and so forth, shares this with a religion in Poland, you know, and be able to say it's all the same for each of these people, despite being in such different circumstances. But with human beings, it's hard to do that because we each have our own subjective experiences. It's hard to say that there is one objective experience of power or reality that we're all tapping into. So anyway, so for Eliade, the role of religion is to promote that contact with holiness or the sacred. And how does this happen? Um, how do you promote contact with this powerful thing? Uh, the first, the first um, contact is through direct experience of the sacred. Okay, these are just a couple of examples I'm giving you. Actually, two examples I'm giving you. I'm not giving you everything, but through direct experience of the sacred. And we saw that, for example, with our friend Isaiah in his Theophany. He directly saw um, the God of Israel. He directly saw his God, the God he was worshiping. The God he was worshiping appeared to him. The holy appeared to him. And so in connection with this word theophany, 
we have this word hierophany, which comes from Eliade, although we might have taken it from uh, somebody else, like Max Weber. But anyways, hierophany. Um, hieros, as you see, is a Greek word for sacred or holy, okay? So, sacer and hieros are the same thing. One is Latin, one is Greek. They both mean sacred or holy. And as I told you before, I told you what phino means. So, an appearance of the holy and hierophany. This is, um, you can call it by different names. You can call it a god or goddess, a spirit, nature, capital N, nature, power or force, the, quote, really real, transcendence, whatever you want to call it. But whatever it is, it's an experience of, or excuse me, it's an appearance of, a manifestation of the sacred to the human person. Okay, when you have this manifestation, then you've had an hierophanic experience. What does this experience entail? In such an experience, the person feels that there is a higher power, which is showing forth to him or her what is, quote-unquote, really real. As I said, this higher power could be a spirit, an angel, just a force, something. Um, it's going to be filtered through the, the religious culture. Um, and here is an example from a religion, the religion of Islam. The religion of Islam. Um, this picture here is uh, from a book uh, by this man Mustafa, you can kind of see it down here below. If I make it bigger, you can see it better, I think. Uh, the Seyir e Nebi, it comes from the 1500s, so this picture is public domain. Um, and uh, this is not the Quran, this is just a book, um, the, the history of the prophet, I think that's what it means. And so it tells stories from the, from the life of the prophet Muhammad who is the originator of the Islamic religion. And the, these squiggles up here, you might think, well, oh, that's Arabic. I've seen that before. This is actually not Arabic. This is Turkish. The, uh, the book was written in Turkish, but it uses Arabic letters to write out the Turkish words. So if you were an Arabic speaker and you looked at this, this would actually look like a bunch of gibberish to you. <laughs> but here, look at, look at this picture. Um, that we have here, and I'll make it bigger for you. This is a picture of when the prophet received the revelation of the Quran, the, the sacred book of Islam. This man on the left, or this figure on the left, is the prophet Muhammad, supposed to be him. This figure on the right, as you might be, have been able to tell from the, the wings, is uh, four of them only, one, two, three, four, um, is an angel is an angel okay now what's interesting about this picture oh several things are interesting about the picture uh the ma the the muhammad uh, the muhammad the prophet muhammad is on a mountain this is mount hira in uh saudi arabia on the arabian peninsula why did i do that i want this um, mount hira which lies just outside the city of mecca and uh, the Prophet Muhammad used to go there to pray. And at one time when he was in prayer, an angel appeared to him, the angel Gabriel. Gabriel, who is called, whoop, be nice if I could spell, who is called Jibreel amongst Muslims, because that is the Arabic form of Gabriel. So we have here Muhammad, and we have over here the, pro, uh, the angel Gabriel. And, uh, oh, you know, of course, drawn according to cultural standards. He has four wings, as angels do. They have wings, just like in the West. Um, he has a crown. I don't know why. Okay, a face. But notice that the, some interesting things about the prophet. First of all, unlike the angel, the prophet is um, engulfed in flames and fire. 
And that's like the equivalent of a halo from the West, you know, like with Jesus or the saints. You'll see a circle that's been drawn around the head to, or they'll show light coming from the head. Um, not unusual, not, not, uh, uh, unusual, excuse me, I shouldn't say, it's not, um, um, typical only of Western culture or not unique to Western culture. Um, if you see statues or pictures of the Buddha in over in India or um, parts of Asia, the Buddha will also have a halo, uh, this round disc behind his head showing that he's a holy man or some spiritual figure. Uh, what's missing from Muhammad though? Let's see, you'll see that his face is missing. His face is missing. It's not drawn. Sometimes you'll find pictures of the prophet with his face drawn, but a lot of times not. Um, you'll just find him with these flames around his head and a blank, a blank here, where, a blank space where his face should be. Why? Because he's a sacred man. He's a sacred person, and he's so sacred that they won't even represent his face. It's considered disrespectful to re it's become dis considered to be disrespectful even to represent his face because he's such a sacred figure. So this is a reading from the sacred book of Islam, the Quran. The Quran, it is in chapter 96 verses 1 through 5. And scholars believe it is one of the earliest if not the earliest chapter in the Quran. So what does it say? Proclaim in the name of your Lord and cherisher who created man out of a clot of congealed blood. Proclaim and your Lord is most bountiful. He who taught the pen taught man that which he knew not okay this is gabriel's appearance to muhammad and he his first words to muhammad are a command recite recite i know it says proclaim there but that's it's a translation it can also mean to recite okay and that's exactly what the name of the Quran means. It means the recitation. It comes from an Arabic word. Um, I think it's kara. I want to make sure I spell it right. Um, an Arabic word which means to recite. And literally, the uh, the book of Quran, the book of Quran, the book, the book of the book of the Quran is really literally a recitation. Um, of God's revelation to Muhammad. Muhammad sees the revelation written before him already, and he simply recites it. He doesn't write it down. He doesn't make it up as he goes along. You know, he doesn't feel any kind of, get some sort of feeling and, and says what he thinks needs to be said. He, he, all Muhammad simply really does is see the words written on a stone in heaven, and he recites them. In fact, he doesn't even know how to write. He's apparently illiterate, and God has to teach him to, gives him the knowledge to write. You know, God, that's this reference to God who teaches the pen, teaches how to write to a man who knew not. You know, apparently Muhammad didn't know how to write. Um, so anyways, so this is the first, this is the, the opening statements of, of the Quran that apparently are written on the stone in heaven and are simply not even Gabriel. Gabriel doesn't even tell um, this to Muhammad. Okay, he just orders him to recite what he sees. Um, and Muhammad's like, well, you know, I'm illiterate. You know, I can't read. I can't write. Well, God gives him the power to do that. So this is an, an hierophany. You have a sacred um, or spiritual figure, in this case, an angel because God doesn't appear, it's just an angel, who, who opens up to Muhammad, allows him to see the really real. The really, and the really real in religion is always the world of the spirits and the gods. I think that's one thing I could say that all religion shares. 
that this world is not real. There are a lot, you'd be surprised how many religions teach that this world is not really real. Christianity and Judaism, um, and of course Islam, um, which is based on, on Christianity and Judaism, but uh, those are the only religions that um, t take the world seriously. Um, the world is not something that is um, in opposition to God. God is the creator of the world in Judaism. The world is a good thing. It's something God intends to exist. But in other religions like Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, native, a lot of native religions, uh, they take the world for granted, yes, but it's not a good thing. The world is, is almost, in a way, an enemy. Nine times out of ten, the world is an opponent. It's trying to kill you. Uh, it's full of evil and badness. And some religions, like Hinduism, simply write off the world. They say, you know, the world's really an illusion. It's simply, it's like being in another person's dream. That's really what the world is. It seems like it's solid. It seems like it has uh, in, intent, intent to it. A rationality to it, purpose to it, but it really doesn't. The only realm that really makes sense is the realm of the divine, the spiritual realm. So the whole of Hindu religion is actually based on trying not to be born again. You you know, because in, in Hinduism they believe in reincarnation, that you come back in multiple lives. And the object of everything in Hinduism, worshipping the gods, from worshipping the gods to doing yoga, to chanting, to, to whatever, um, living your life, is to break this cycle of reincarnation so that you don't come back again. You don't come back into this body, which is also an illusion. The body is seen as a jail for the spirit. You want to be released into the spiritual divine realm where you are part of the all. And the all is part of you. And you kind of are like a drop of honey, in a manner of speaking, or a drop of salt that is, that, that is, uh, falls into the ocean, the abyss. And you dissolve away into the abyss and you don't know you don't know it's like tasting salt water or water that's had honey put into it you don't know where the drop of honey is it's all mixed up now and that's kind of imagery used to describe the experience of ending uh, of breaking out of the cycle of death and rebirth and being part of the all But that's not Judaism or Christianity. These are religions that take the world seriously as truly existing. Um, but this is in hierophany, this revelation of the sacred. Another one, well, I have to actually put the PowerPoint on for this. Okay, here. This picture you see this picture you see, uh, this is another example of an hierophany, okay? And maybe you can make it out. It's, it's two, it looks like two men, two men. One is yellow, one is blue, who are sitting in a chariot. And you see the chariot has four horses. You can see the horses here. They're pulling the chariot, okay? rather ornate chariot. You see this guy's sitting. This guy's also kind of sitting in a yogic position. You'll notice he has the leg up in kind of a yoga position. He's holding on to the bridles of the horses, so he's the charioteer. Um, what is this? This is, this is another example of an hierophany uh, from the Hindu religion. It comes from, and now I'm going to have to go back. It comes from a huge work called the Maha Bharata. 
the Mahabharata. And it's just a huge story. It's a, it's a, it's the grand, if you want to put it this, let's put it this way. It's the grand epic of India, if you want to put it that way. It's the grand epic story of the people of the su Indian subcontinent. Um, I can't get into it. Uh, I don't want to get into it too much because it would take too long to explain the whole story. But anyways, it's just a huge story. And it's, and it's, um, it's full of all sorts of different stories as well. So you've got all sorts of different things stuffed into this one story, which is kind of like this great story of the peoples of India, but really focuses on um, the Bharata clan, this clan of people, the Bharatas or the Bharats, um, and what happens to their family. But Bharata is another name for India as well. And what is happening here in this uh, picture is uh, this is a, a picture of one of the events that's described. Actually, maybe I shouldn't show that to you yet. Is one of the events that's described in the Mahabharata, which is the Battle of Kurukshetra. Kur oh, excuse me, Kurukshetra. Uh, it'd be nice if I could spell. Kurukshetra, and I misspelled it again. You got to be kidding me. Kurukshetra. I wonder if it's my. I have a sneaking suspicion that this is my keyboard, but whatever. Anyways, the land. Uh, I believe it's the Kauras. Two families: the Kauras and the Pandava. Pandavas. The Kaura family and the Pandava family. So I misspelled that as well. Um, who go to war, these two families, the Kauras and the Pandavas family, the Pandavas go to war against each other at a place called Kurukshetra, the land of the Kauras. Why? Again, this, as I said, the story is just too long and intricate to get into. But it basically comes down to honor, the question of honor, and uh, one person felt that he had been dishonored by another, uh, uh, you know, one member of one family felt that he had been dishonored by the member, a member of the other family, and uh, so, um, you know, they, um, they had a bet, they had a bet that um, if uh, the one guy... Uh, could uh, win a dice match, then um, then the you know the whole dishonor thing would be forgotten. Otherwise, he would have to go into exile. You know, he have to leave the area for I think ten years or so, but a number of years. And uh, unfortunately, the guy who had dishonored the other guy and had to go and you know do the dice match was a very bad dice player. So of course he loses, and he has to go into exile for a number of years as his punishment for having dishonored this person. Well, when he comes back, the agreement was, he comes back from exile, he would receive all his stuff back, his land and property and the stuff that he had to lose uh, by going into exile. And when he comes back, you know, the guy who had been dishonored by him um, kind of, you know, hems and haws about giving this guy, you know, agree, let's say living up to the terms of the agreement, you know. And so the guy's like, well, wait a second. I lost the dice match because I, you know, I dishonored you. I lost a dice match. I went into exile as per our agreement. Okay. Um, everything should be fine now. Now give me back my stuff. Well, the, uh, the upshot of is it, uh, of the, uh, or the result is he will not, um, even though the guy fulfilled the requirements. And so now we're going to have a war over this guy's lack of honor, um, his own lack of honor by not abiding by the agreement. Um, so here in this picture, you have one of the chariots that's going to be part of the war, and this guy, and he's also holding a bow, a bow and arrow, this guy whose name is Arjuna. Arjuna. Sometimes pronounced Arjun, but Arjuna. And he's in the chariot with his charioteer. 
to whom we'll get we'll get to him in a moment. And Arjuna is about to raise his hand to begin the battle of Kurukshetra over this, you know, slight of honor. And as he's about to begin the battle, he's looking across the plain at these other people who are related to him. I mean, these families, if I remember correctly the story, these families are related to each other. And on the other side are all the supporters of the other family. I think the Pandavas. I, I want to, I forget, I'd have to go check my notes to see which was the bad family that, uh, whatever, you know, I think it was the, it might have been the, the Pandus or the Kuru, but anyways. But nevertheless, he's looking over at his enemies, these people who are now his enemies, and he sees longtime friends, uncles, he sees religious teachers, you know, gurus, who are all ready now to slaughter him and his family because this other dude is breaking his promise. And it makes Arjuna start to question the whole purpose of life. You know, is this what life is? Senseless slaughter over a matter of honor? You know, isn't there anything better that we could be doing, you know, than doing this, you know? Couldn't we all step back? And um, so he, he starts, you know, kind of raising these questions. And he starts into a dialogue with his charioteer here, this guy here, the blue guy. And they have this dialogue back and forth about the questions that Arjuna is having. About, should I do this? You know, should I lower my hand or, or start the battle off? Because this is nuts. And uh, the, the conversation that occurs uh, between Arjuna and his charioteer, his driver, in and of itself is its own book. And it's called the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita. Which in English translates to the Song of the Lord the Lord. Okay, in Sanskrit, Gita is a song, or Git is a song, and Bhagwad, Bhagwad, or Bhagwan as well, you see it in various forms, um, means Lord, Master, Ruler. Well, I'll say Lord or Master is better. So the song of the Lord. Which Lord, you might ask? Well, Lord Krishna. Because we find out, we find out that Arjuna, our buddy Arjuna, has not just been talking to any old person, but the person who is his charioteer is actually an appearance of a god, Krishna, who is actually the appearance of another god, but <laughs> yeah, Hinduism can be confusing with its gods and goddesses, okay? One god is another god is another god, okay? But actually, it kind of makes sense in Hindu theology if you understand that the all is one and the one is all, all right? Um, but anyways, in his conversation with our with this, this what he thinks is a man, um, eventually he starts to realize, wait, there's something different about this blue dude, you know? <laughs> he doesn't seem to be a normal human being, and he kind of intuits and experiences that he's in the presence of a god and asks for him to reveal himself. And so he does. And here we have it from the Bhagavad Gita chapter 11 verses 9 through 3 or lines 9 through 13 excuse me I know I'm, I'm messing up a lot now because it's you know it's almost two and a half hours and I'm just I'm getting a little pooped having spoken thus Hari the great lord of the possessors of mystic power then showed to the son of Prita his supreme divine form having many mouths and eyes having many wonderful sights, having many celestial heavenly ornaments, having many heavenly weapons held erect, wearing heavenly flowers and vestments, having an anointment of heavenly perfumes, full of every wonder, 
the infinite God with faces in all directions. If in the heavens the luster of a thousand suns burst forth all at once, that would be like the luster of the mighty one. And in a way, in other words, it's saying, you know, like, if a thousand suns exploded all at once, that would be like the glory of Krishna. There, the son of Pandu. Okay, so the Pandus were the good people. The, the, the Kuru family, or the Kauravas, were the bad, the baddies. There, the son of Pandu, then observed, and this is Arjuna, the son of Pandu, then observed in the body of the god of gods, the whole universe, in one and divided. Then Dhananjai, filled with amazement and with hair standing on end, bowed his head before the god and spoke with joined hands. Okay. I got it. This is, you know, a very foreign scripture to a lot of us. It's not the Bible, but even the Bible has its issues. You have to explain things. Just to explain to you some of these names and epithets that are used. For example, so for at the very beginning, having spoken thus, Hari, the great lord of the possessors of mystical power. Hari is another name for the god Vishnu. And again, I have to go to my thing here. So Krishna is Vishnu, and Vishnu is Krishna. Okay, but Vishnu really comes first. All right, Vishnu is another god, one of the great gods of um, Hinduism. He's called Vishnu the Preserver. Basically, he's kind of like a cleaner. You know, yeah, he's kind of like um, a guy who cleans up messes. So Vishnu, the preserver, whenever the law of the universe is threatened of being destroyed, Vishnu enters into the world as a form to kind of uphold the law and bring everything back to order. Notice he enters the world. He doesn't become part of the world. He doesn't become a human being. Like Jesus is God in the flesh. God becomes a human being. He becomes a little baby. Vishnu doesn't do that. Vishnu stays wherever Vishnu is, but he makes an appearance as a divine figure. In this case, as the Lord Krishna, okay, who a lot of Hindus simply worship in, in his own right, okay. Um, now you'll notice, you can notice the connection in the picture. If you look at the picture, and for this I'm going to have to take the words out so you can see it clearly, but if you look at this picture, you'll see on the forehead, you'll see on the forehead of Krishna here, on the forehead of Krishna, you see this thing, these, these vertical lines, white and red. Um, the, um, in Hinduism, when people want to show which god they're devoted to, okay, the, uh, sometimes they will take paste, kind of a... Um, you know, um, what do you call it? Not, you know, like powder, colored powder. They'll mix it with water or a certain or liquid and make it into a paste. And then they'll smear it on their foreheads. Okay? This is not the same thing as Hindu women who have dots on their foreheads, colored dots, because those represent different things. Okay? The, the dot on a woman's forehead, a Hindu woman's forehead, can mean she's married can also mean some other, have some other spiritual meanings. This is not the same thing. These are lines drawn on the forehead, white and red paste. And if they go up and down, almost like a V, it's almost like a V, that's how I remember it. It's for Vishnu. It shows that this is a believer in Vishnu, and it shows that Krishna is really Vishnu. Okay, so we're getting a sign here a sent through the symbolism of the paste on Krishna's forehead is telling us he is an incarnation of Vishnu. He is an appearance of Vishnu. He is not Vishnu, but he's an appearance of Vishnu. It's kind of like a reflection of Vishnu. Um, now, what if the lines go straight across? So let's take a picture. Let's take, excuse me, a look at this. Um, I just typed in devotee Vishnu. You can see a whole bunch of pictures here, and, and here's an example, okay, of a Hindu man who is a devotee of the god Vishnu. And you can see he's got his whole forehead painted with this white paste and this red paste in the middle, okay, all vertical lines, 
Uh, let's see if we have another. Oh, here's another guy having it applied to himself. It even says applying the Vishnu symbol on the forehead of Lord Balaji. Okay, so they're doing that. Let's take a look at the Shiva symbol. Or Shiva, uh, I guess, head painting. Okay, let's see what we got here. Here's a dude. We got this dude here. And okay, you see the vertical lines. You'll have vertical lines going with the um, red. Okay, so you see this. Um, and I think the trident is also one of the things that's held by Shiva. And the snake. I forget the name of the snake. Um, Shiva sleeps on a snake, uses a snake as a bed until he awakens. And uh, I forget what he does after that. But anyways, in the time, I think the time between different ages, Shiva, before Shiva has to go to work, or so, I guess, he sleeps on a snake bed. And I forget the name of the snake. But anyways, um, so here we see uh, this. And I want to find maybe... Um, a better example, more obvious example. Uh, I'm not seeing anything. Come on, people. Where are you? Um, okay, that works for me. There's another religious type. It's kind of uh, not totally uh, a, a big picture. Let's see if we can get the image bigger. I want to get try to get close. Okay, there. So you see the three lines. The three lines that will go across this guy's head, okay? And again, he's carrying the trident, which is a symbol or a weapon or something that's carried by by Shiva, okay? And this is a holy man, a sadhu, as they say, a sadhu. Okay, so these things indica are indicators. And so we have the indicator here on the head that this is, Sh uh, excuse me, this is Vishnu we're dealing with and not Shiva and not Shiva. So uh, let me pull out because we want to get back to the text. And of course I screwed up the text so I got to go back. Sorry about that. That was on the PowerPoint. There we go. So Hari is another name for Vishnu, okay? And uh, you'll find that a lot of the gods and goddesses in Hinduism have nicknames um, or other names by which they are known. So it can be kind of confusing and difficult to try and follow who's being talked about. Um, Prita and Pandu, it mentions son of Prita. And where's Pandu? And son of Pandu, these are referring to Arjuna. These are ancestors of Arjuna. And um, Dhananjai means bringer of wealth or conqueror of wealth, um, which I believe is being referred here to uh, Arjuna as well. Then the conqueror of wealth filled with amazement and with hair sitting on him bowed down before Krishna, the god, or really Vishnu. Um, it's interesting because this word amazement can also mean dismay, can also mean dismay. So I'm not sure which one it is. But the translation goes with amazement, so we'll stay with that. Um, again, notice all these features of the numinous experience, of Otto's numinous experience. Uh, this, this, of course, I'm using as an example of an hierophany um, of, of uh, Eliade's idea of an appearance of the sacred, which it is. But, uh, and, and uh, notice this great description of you know, Vishnu is the great Lord who has all the mystical powers. And he showed his supreme divine form with many mouths and eyes, um, all sorts of heavenly ornaments, all sorts of weapons and flowers and perfumes. He smells good. He looks good. He's got all sorts of faces in all directions, which shows that he is, um, that's, that's, that's a symbolic way to show that he is everywhere, that he sees everywhere. He sees everything, knows everything, because his face faces in every direction. Um, 
and his glory is like the the like the explosion of a thousand suns okay um that's what his glory is like so you get this description of his glory um what is Arjuna's response, his response is to be filled with amazement and this little detail that every hair was standing on end, you know, it was like an electricity in the air to see the glory or to experience the glory of Krishna. And what does he do? He bows down. He gets on the ground. And doesn't Isaiah do the same thing? If I look at Isaiah 6, doesn't Isaiah fall to the ground? Isaiah chapter 6, you know? It says it's filled with smoke. Blah, blah, blah. No, he doesn't fall to the ground. Okay, but here Arjuna falls to the ground. Remember this connection with dust and ashes. Almost like we return to our source. We return to the earth. We want to get as close down to the earth as possible. Not just, you know, press ourselves down to make ourselves lower, uh, you know, maybe so the, I don't know, maybe the thing won't notice us or something, won't hurt us. Um, but uh, this symbolic gesture of putting our whole bodies back down to the earth, which is really our mother, it's the source of our existence, the earth. Um, whether you believe in the, 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 the Genesis story, the Genesis story says that humanity was made from the earth. Or if you believe in biological evolution, which says that we came out of, you know, the muck and the scummy waters of planet Earth, you know, filled with proteins, and that's where we came from. So it's the same, same thing. We came from the Earth. And it's interesting that we don't raise ourselves up in the face of the sacred. We bow down to the dust, like Otto says. We feel our creatureliness. And... Uh, Arjuna certainly feels his creatureliness because he realizes that he has he a creature has been talking to talking to one of the gods. Okay? So this is an example of an hierophany, but Hinduism. Okay? Uh, what's our next where do we go now? That's the first thing, hierophany. The second way we experience um the uh, the sacred yes hold on a second here um, is by t by making something sacred human beings can be creators of the sacred through this process called the dialect that Eliade called the dialectic of the sacred and this is when we take a a normal everyday item a profane item and we change it into the sacred. So you have your definition. It's the act of infusing the supernatural or sacred reality into a natural or profane object. Actually, that's a better, I like that better as a definition than what I have here. So the, it's, uh, the, the act of infusing the supernatural or sacred reality into a natural or profane object. I think that's a better, clearer, clearer definition. I'll put commas here. Okay. This word dialectic comes from two Greek words here. You can't really see it, so maybe I'll make it bigger. Uh, dia and logos. Dia means through or across through or across. And you know this word because if you know geometry, if you know geometry and you deal with circles, you talk about the radius and the diameter. Okay, one word is Latin, one word is Greek. So if we take a, a circle, okay, the diameter is the measurement through. Yes, the diameter. It's, it's meter, measure, and dia dia, through, or across, and the radius is just this, you know, what goes from the middle out, that's the radius, okay, it radiates, as we might say, all right, so you know this word already, and logos, I think I've mentioned logos before, it means word, it means speech, it means thought, or reason, okay, it has a whole bunch of meanings, you can use it in the sense of thing, and some, it's a very, um, 
useful word, okay? But really what it means is word or speech, then it can also be extended to include the mind, thought, and reason. So dialogos, a dialectic, is kind of like a conversation, dialogue in a way. And so the definition here is it's the process of reasoning by which one juxtaposes and combines opposite ideas or realities. Okay, all right, well, that's kind of a fancy way of saying it's a conversation in which, uh, and, and this is with any conversation, uh, with a conversation you have to have a partner. You don't converse with yourself. So when you converse with somebody, you throw out ideas, the other person throws out ideas, maybe a third person throws in some ideas, and at the end of the day, through that dialectic, um, maybe you've reasoned to something. So let's say, we, like in our course, we want to talk about what religion is. And I throw out my ideas of what I think religion is. And maybe Ms. So-and-so throws in her ideas, and Mr. So-and-so offers his ideas. And at the end of the day, we try to bring them together through our conversation, our dialectic, to one maybe idea that includes these 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 things, the, the, well, I should say the valuable insights, you know, S stuff that's helpful, not stuff that, you know, doesn't make any sense, you know, because if you just throw in everything, then you've got chaos. It has to make some sense what you're putting together. So there's a dialogue or a conversation of the sacred, okay, um, where opposite ideas are juxtaposed and combined, and in this case it would be realities. Which realities? The realities of the sacred and the profane. The profane is being combined into the supernatural reality. Okay? How does this work? Let me just... Uh, Alright, I got some examples here. How does this work? I have some examples. Right. Okay. Places, things, people, and so forth can become and can be revered or honored as special or different. They can be honored as things that reveal something beyond, something more. Could be music. Um, it could be a place. Excuse me, I'm just drinking some coffee. You know, it could be a particular mountain that people have always gone to. Um, it could be a country, even. You know, a lot of people, uh, since the 1960s, you know, you had a lot of hippies and people who went to India looking for enlightenment. Um, could be just an area of the world, like India. Uh, I remember Alanis Morissette had a song back in the 90s called Thank You, India. And uh, although I'm not really an Alanis Morissette fan, I certainly am a fan of Indian food. Thank you, India! <laughs> Anyways, um, it could be a person, like a priest. You know, once a man is a priest, he is a sacred thing. He's a sacred person in the eyes of the church. There are things that a priest should not do because he is a priest. A priest should not fight in wars. Um, in the case of certain Roman Catholic priests, they don't. They take a promise to not get married. They promise to dedicate themselves 100% to the service of, to their religious service. Now, you know, people ha seem to have a problem with that. People don't seem to have a problem with Buddhist monks doing the same thing. You know, Buddhist monks take a vow of, of chastity, of celibacy. They don't get married. Okay? You don't see a Buddhist monk walking around with his wife and kids. So it's not unusual. It happens in other religions. Um, you know, the... Um, and enough, okay, so I'll just to show you some of these pictures. So places can be sacred. Um, you should know this already. This is the temple in Jerusalem, or at least a model thereof. 
um, this very place was sacred. And in fact, we find that Israel, because God, God was present amongst his people in the temple, Israel was described as the navel or the belly button of the world, as the belly button of the world. Okay, which is interesting, interesting. The, the navel is considered the midpoint of the body in Hebrew thought, okay? It's like your, your torso, your, your mid, we even say that, your midriff, you know? What does that mean when a, a woman is showing, wearing a shirt where she shows her midriff? It means she's showing her navel to people. Um, so we still have this idea. So the same idea in Judaism in the Bible, we find this stated in the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 38, verse 12. Let's look at this. Ezekiel, did I say 38 for Ezekiel? There we are. And verse 12. Actually, I have to begin a little bit more above. Um, Ezekiel was not in Israel at the time, or Judah. He was living in exile um, far, far away in another country. He was a, a part of a bunch of Jews who had been um, taken as slaves and servants and brought into exile to this, this country um, because Judah had been attacked and taken over so Israel but even even there in this foreign country amongst foreign people God raises up the prophet Ezekiel amongst the Jews to, to tell them you know this is why you're being punished this is why Judah is going through some hard times and oh by the way the temple will be destroyed you know this prophecy of Jeremiah about the temple being destroyed is going is starting to come true and will come true and Ezekiel confirms that it will come true. He says, don't place your hopes that in the temple, you know, that God is still with us because the temple will be destroyed. Anyways, thus says the Lord God, on that day thoughts shall cross your mind and you shall devise an evil plan. You will say, I will invade a land of open villages and attack a peaceful people who live and security, all of them living without city walls, bars, or gates. Why will you do this? In order to plunder and pillage, turning your hand against resettled ruins, against the people gathered from the nations, a people whose concern is cattle and goods, dwelling at the center of the earth. And it goes on, okay? Um, what is Ezekiel talking about? Well, he's talking about people who will attack the people of Israel. Okay, that's what the whole thing is going on about. But it doesn't, you know, we don't really, I'm really concerned about the context of the prophecy. Uh, you see there's a little footnote here. And if you go down, they translate center of the world from navel. They say literally, me, literally it means navel or belly button, but we've translated it, translated it as center of the earth because people, I guess, will understand that better. Go back up here. So you're going to invade a people who don't even have city walls. You know, they're all out in the open. They're peaceful people. They're just living their lives. And you're going to go there to plunder and pillage this people. They've been gathered from amongst the nations. Their concern is their cattle and, and their goods dwelling at the, navel, the Earth's navel, belly button, the Earth's belly button. And this is, you know, a statement, this is a phrase, uh, navel of the Earth, or belly button of the Earth, that is used to describe the land of Israel, once presumably the people have returned. And what is this Hebrew word? This, the phrase that's used as navel of the world is al Tabur Haaretz, the, the navel of the land. Okay, this word Tabur is Hebrew for navel or the more Germanic and more colloquial belly button. It's Hebrew, so we'll do that. 
Tabor, Hebrew word. Okay, so Jerusalem, or excuse me, Israel, is considered considered such a sacred spot. It's the sacredest place on earth because God dwells there. Hence, it is like the center of the earth. And just as the navel or the belly button is the center uh, or midpoint of the body, that that um, image is used to describe the land of Israel itself. This again, this 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 imagery, this this dialectic of the sacred, um, making your country sacred, the place where God is, is not unusual. Okay, we see this. I'm giving you an example from the Jewish religion, but we also have an example from other cultures as well. The Chinese, this is the Hei Zun artifact, or actually a rubbing from it. Um, it is a, um, a bronze vessel, a bronze vessel, that's what a Zun is, um, used for, uh, you know, used for wine, for uh, carrying for filling it with wine. And on this vessel, archaeologists found this ancient Chinese text in which, for the first time, the name for China is used. And here I have drawn a box around the two words, Zhong Guo, Zhong Guo. And here it is larger. So you can see it better, Zhong Guo, which in Chinese means the Middle Kingdom. Okay, the Heizun, Heizun vessel, it dates to around the 7th century BC, that would be the 600s BC, and it's the earliest um, example of the name for China, Zhong Guo, which means middle kingdom. Now, middle of the what? Kingdom at the middle of the world. Okay, so again, this idea that we, pe we are sacred ourselves, we people are sacred, our, our nation is sacred, our land area is so sacred that we are at the center of the universe. We are the middle kingdom. Okay, so you, this is a very old idea, obviously, and, uh, and you find this in different cultures. Uh, one last example I could give you, uh, I don't believe I have a picture of it, but um, or two examples, one from India and one from Japan. The Japanese people believe that their islands were created by two gods, Izanagi, Izanagi, and Izanami. Izanagi is a male god, and Izanami is a goddess, his consort, his wife, if you will. Um, how do you remember who's the male and who's the female? Well, Izanagi is the guy. Izanagi is the guy. So that's how you remember who the guy is, is a nagai. So Izanagi and Izanami created the Japanese islands, so and the Japanese people. So um, you don't get much more directly connected to divinity than that, <laughs> you know, when you when your your country and your whole gene pool comes from two gods. And, and of course, the emperor of Japan was considered uh, a descendant of Izanagi and Izanami, so was considered a son of the gods. Uh, so that's, a, that's an example from Japan. In, um, in India, you have the city of Varanasi. Varanasi, it's also called Benares, goes by several names. Um, and it is a, a very famous city and a very sacred city in India. You have a lot of temples there. A lot of people make pilgrimages there Okay, to, uh, to these places. Okay, so I believe that that is enough of our friend Eliade. 
have some other examples from Christianity. You see here the Pope, who is ordaining a man to the priesthood, and he places his hands on the head of the man, on the head of the man, but also during the ceremony, the man's hands are physically anointed. Oil is placed on the hands of this the man who is to be a pre, who is a priest to anoint and make his hands sacred so that he can touch sacred things and he can handle them. And typically the hands of a non, um, non priestly person like me, a person who is not a clergyman or a, cler or a woman who is not a priest or something, you know, typically in the traditionally, um, those people were not allowed to touch things that a priest could touch. So we weren't supposed to touch the chalice, the cup that the priest uses, or the plates or stuff like that, because these were sacred vessels that had also been anointed with oil and consecrated for the service of God. And, uh, but, you know, times have changed and maybe some of those customs will come back. I just think people don't know about them anymore. Um, but they do mean something. You might say, well, do they mean everything? No. Okay, it's not the end of the world if someone touches the cup that the priest uses without knowing. No, I mean, it's, you know, these are symbol symbolic things. Is, it, is the priest's, are the priest's hands changed into something else by having them anointed, having had them anointed? No. Um, but there is something special that's going on. And maybe that's the reason that um, I give you this yes and no. Um, maybe that indicates a problem in the, my definition of religion or the sacred. Maybe we need, you know, what does this, this do? Um, takes the priest's hands out of the ordinary and the everyday. The hands of the priest are no longer to be used for normal things. Um, like a regular occupation, his his hands should be used in in the service of others and in celebrating and offering the sacraments of God. Okay, um, but for a lot of people in the Western world, this kind of stuff means nothing anymore. You know, they think, oh, it's just you know, they it's a symbol of you know, they just put oil on his hands to show he's special. It's a little ritual. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Okay, well, in the di for Eliade, it does mean something. It, it, this, in this dialectic of the sacred, you are taking something profane, like parts of this person's body or the person himself, and making that person sacred. Alrighty, let's move on from Eliade to this gentleman, David Emil Durkheim. David Emil Durkheim was born in 1858 and died in 1917. Durkheim was a Jew. He came from a devout Jewish family. I believe he had several rabbis in the family, including, I think, his father. But by Durkheim's teenage years, he had he could become an agnostic. He eventually became a professor at the University of Bordeaux and then the University of Paris, Bordeaux, and then the University of Paris. He was a pioneer in this new field of sociology. Sociology, not the father of sociology, but he was a pioneer. Remember um, what we what we looked at before when I went over um, all the influences, the uh, the predecessors, the things that built up to the academic study of religion, all the influences on the academic study of religion. Remember, in the 1800s, because of the Enlightenment and the emergence of the scientific method as a real powerful force and way of doing things, everyone wanted to be scientific, okay? 
everyone wanted to be considered important. And, uh, and so everyone started devising all sorts of methodologies for studying all sorts of things. So for studying human culture, people came up with anthropology. For studying um, societies, we have sociology, as you can see from the definition. What's the difference between sociology and anthropology? They, they are related. Um, sociology focus more, focuses more on the social constructions of human behavior. Okay, the, how um, humans interact with each other and what kind of societies they create. As you can see from the Latin, the word sociology and society come from the word socius, socius which means a companion, a partner, a comrade. You could also say a colleague, a colleague, an associate. We use that word as well. You know, we watch the cop shows and they talk about, well, what's, who are this, who are, who are this person's associates? You know, who does he or she associate with? You know, comes from the Latin word socius. Who are his companions? You know, who does he hang out with? Who, who, who is he together with? And so that's kind of like what society is, bringing people together. And when they come together, what do they create? What do they create? Um, so this was a new science. Okay, so he was a pioneer in the ideas of this science, uh, as were a lot of sciences. Psycho modern psychology, modern astronomy, religious studies, of course. Um, I mentioned sociology, anthropology, um, economics, you name it, literature, and just about every area of study, people were influenced by the Enlightenment and, want, and, and, and its emphasis on using human reason alone as the only authority by which you argue and discover results and analyze results. And so everybody wanted to get into the game, okay, each in his own field. And interest, because religion was such a universal thing, religion was all over the place. It was part of everybody's background and upbringing. Um, you know, they all kind of cut their teeth on religion. So it's not a surprise that in anthropology, sociology, psychology, economics, that religion gets, uh, is usually the first thing that's studied. Uh, because it was, it's, was so prevalent. It was such a part of European life. Okay, our buddy Emil wrote some things, wrote some books. Okay, his works include um, his doctoral dissertation called The Division of Labor and Society which, as you can see, was only translated in 1984. Uh, another book called The Rules of Sociological Method, uh, only translated in 1982 into English, rather interesting, because um, you would think that that would be one of the classics of sociological, um, uh, classics of uh, sociological education. You'd have to read that, but anyways. The book Suicide, um, which was translated earlier, much earlier, interesting, um, and that's an interesting book. He looks at the religious question of, you know, which group of people would be more likely to kill them, kill himself, you know, which, the people of which group would be more likely to kill themselves, Protestants or Catholics? And that might be, you know, a question you might ask yourself and then ask me in class and I can tell you the answer. But yes, he asked the question, you know, he looked at suicide. You know, who would be more likely to kill himself, a Protestant or a Catholic? Then fam his, his famous book, uh, The Elementary Forms of the Religious Life, as you can see there, translated almost very quickly, 1915. And he was also founder and editor of L'Année Sociologique, the sociological yearly, you might say in English, but uh, a journal in which scholars in the field could publish their work. So all of this hinges, or, you know, Durkheim's study of religion 
all really hinges on his concept of society. And in my opinion, maybe the word interrelationships is, is better to use than society, okay? The, the concept of how human beings interrelate to each other. Um, for Durkheim, society or our interrelationships, uh, interrelationship of human beings, was the determinative basis for all human life. And this is kind of a problem with all these early, um, with, with these pioneers, uh, is that they tend to collapse everything, everything that is human, down into one experience and pretty much either ignore or marginalize, push off to the margins, other experiences. So since Durkheim was a sociologist, of course, everything has to be based on society. Everything about human life has to do with interrelationships, okay? And to some extent, there, there is validity to that. I mean, from the very first moment we exist, we exist in um, one of the most basic forms of society, which is the dyad. This is a sociological term. I got to be honest with you, I had to take sociology when I was in community college doing my associate's degree. Um, and to be honest with you, this is probably the only thing I remember from <laughs> two semesters of sociology because I had no idea why I had to take it. I still don't know why it was a required course, but I had to take it and it bored the life out of me, bored me to death. Uh, but this one crazy little word, dyad, I remembered. <laughs> okay, and now I get to use it. Um, it comes from the Greek for the word two, duo. Duo, which means the number two in Greek, a dyad. Actually, I should make that a Y. Duo. Um, yeah, anyways. Um, dyad. So the most basic form of society is the ta is the dyad, two people together. So we already, from our very existence in the womb of our mother, exist in society, one could claim. One should claim. I think that's true. I think we are, in our nature, social beings. Um, even though there might be times when we want to get away from each other, maybe for the rest of our lives, um, there is a really interesting insight there that from the first moment of our existence in the womb, we are already in a, a, an intimate, deeply interrelated relationship or, or situation with another human being, such that to um, remove us from that situation would end our life, you know? You, a baby, a fetus, is completely locked into the mother. I mean, the, the fetus doesn't feed itself on its own. Um, the blood supply is coming from the mother. Nutrients come from the mother. Warmth, the heat and warmth of the mother's body keeps the baby warm um, and comfortable. So we are already in this societal relationship at the very basic level. So I think he's right in that. Um, one is always part of a larger group or a larger circle of relationships than just oneself. As alone as you might want to be, and people say they want to get off the grid. That's been the big thing over the last few years on television. You turn on these shows like Buying Alaska or Living Alaska and stuff like that, and you've got these people who are like, I want to get off the grid. I'm going to grow my own food. I'm going to, you know, uh, have my own water. No plumbing. We're just, we're not going to ha have any, any water pumped in. We're going to use rain water, snow water. We're not even going to have plumbing for the toilet. We're going to use uh, compost and toilet. And, you know, we're not even, we're going to have solar panels. So we won't need to elect, uh, you know, hook up to any grid and stuff. It's funny how people don't, you know, people want to be off the grid, but they still want all the benefits of the grid, quote unquote, uh, the, the quote unquote grid, you know. <laughs> but anyways, I've never heard someone say, I want to be off the grid and they really mean it. You know, like I just want to live 
in a cabin in the forest somewhere with no amenities, no electricity, no plumbing, indoor, outdoor, you know, I got to go poop out in the forest. I, I really, I have to cook my own food. You know, I collect rainwater in buckets, which I save somewhere, you know, that's off the grid to me. But, you know, building a mansion out somewhere and you've got generators and stuff so you can have electricity and you've got septic systems so that a septic system so you you know you can still use the toilet and whatever you don't have to go to an outhouse that to me is not off the grid but i digress so but you're still always part of a bigger circle of relationships why because you still need someone somewhere to have built the place you know and for you to get stuff to this alaska you need people to bring it to you by airplane, by boat, somehow it has to be brought to you, okay? There's very few people, I think, who are going to be able to bring all the stuff by themselves, okay? We need each other. And the reason that life is livable on this planet is that there are so many of us. You know, imagine if there were some devastation and the population of Earth was cut in half, so there were only three and a half billion people on the planet rather than seven billion. And some, per some people might say, well, that's great, you know. But think about that. Imagine if there were only half the population of the United States living here. We have 150 million instead of 300 million. And up in Canada, you had only 10 million, or excuse me, 15 million people instead of 30 million in Canada. All right? Think about that. You might say, well, that's still a lot of people. No, it's not. When you consider how huge America is, imagine in your mind if every other person you met didn't exist anymore. That's what we're talking about. And a lot of jobs that those people would have been doing that make my life livable, that I'm not doing because I don't have to do, um, keeping the electricity going, for one thing, just so I can do this, do this course with you um, would not be doable anymore or or would at least be a lot harder to do you know we'd all have there was a reason why most people were back on farms 200 years ago and you know because you needed to eat you simply needed to eat there was no Wegmans to go out to you know there wasn't there wasn't any there wasn't a place for people to go and buy food from other people Maybe in cities, yes, you could bring your produce into the city and, and sell it. But most people living 100, 200 miles way out in the country, okay, with no automobile, no freeway, you're working to eat. That's what you're doing. You're working to survive. Okay? Um, so we need each other. Family. Clan, tribe, nation. We need these things. Okay? If there weren't thousands, tens of thousands of men and women out on ships, in planes, in forts and barracks who were willing to defend this country from an invasion, how long do you think we would last without an invasion? You know? How long? I mean, of course, there are some countries on the planet that nobody wants to invade because they don't have anything. They don't have the natural resources. But I mean, it, but then again, sometimes they do and countries invade them and take them over. Because why? Because they can. They're more powerful. All right. But we have thousands of people, bombs, people looking over the bombs, making sure they don't go off. Um, but we have thousands of people looking out for the rest of us so that we can live a life. That's their life. That's the choice they've made in their life to be in the military, okay? Or in government or, or in diplomacy. People forget about diplomats and people like that who also keep us safe by making agreements and make our lives a lot easier. I mean, without diplomacy, you couldn't send a letter to Canada. You couldn't get anything out of the United States or into it. I mean, that takes treaties. So we live in a nation, we live in a world, we do live in societies, 
that are interconnected. For Durkheim, then, religion is part of society and is a purely social phenomenon. Okay, this is where I have a problem with Durkheim collapsing everything into his field. You know, everything is societal. Well, I, I think there's a real insight, but religion is simply, for Durkheim, the projection of one society onto the world. That's what religion is, okay? Here, I think Durkheim kind of confuses culture with religion, okay? Yes, obviously, um, people are going to project their culture onto things. Um, you know, uh, so for example, you, you can see this in Buddhism. You can trace out the history of Buddhism from India, from northern India, where the Buddha was, and after his death to how Buddhism was taken other places, down to Sri Lanka, into Southeast Asia, into Thailand, and Vietnam, and places like that, then up into China, then over into Korea, then into Japan. And in each place, the Buddhism, the Buddhism maybe the core idea of Buddhism has remained, but, you know, there is, you know, the, the religion has been changed by the cultures that it encountered. And to some extent, maybe to a large extent in some places, the culture has been projected onto the original, the original set of ideas, um, religious ideas, one might say, um, of the Buddha, of the Buddha. But I don't think, I don't think it's true to say that the Buddha was projecting his society on or onto the religion because he he rejected the religion he tr the story of buddha for example is that he tried all the solutions that were offered to him by his culture on how to live the good life and he found them all wanting he wasn't satisfied with any of them so how does that fit into durkheim's view that Religion is simply the proje a man or a woman's projection of their society onto the world, onto the supernatural world in this case. For Durkheim, humans use speech about gods, spirits, the supernatural, etc., to really describe social reality. Okay, so when you're reading a religious text, the question is not whether these things exist or not, because, you know, as you know, Durkheim was an agnostic. Of course these things didn't exist. Or if they did exist, it was impossible to know whether gods existed. Nevertheless, that wasn't the point of religion. In, talk, in using religious language, you know, the religion was really talking about social reality. Okay? So if you look, for example, say at Hinduism, and you look at the various degrees or the various levels of gods. You know, I mentioned Shiva and Vishnu. Vishnu makes appearances to the earth as Krishna and as other beings and stuff like that. What is Vishnu's purpose? Vishnu has to restore order. Well, what is order? Well, that's the order of Indian society, you know. You got to keep the rulers in their position and have make sure that people have respect for them. You have the warriors in their position doing what they need to do, which is to fight and do battle. You have the merchants and the businessmen in their position. And at the very bottom, you have the lowlifes, the outcasts who nobody wants to touch. And they should, and basically the message is everyone needs to know at which level of society he is. And that's how you relate to the gods. So there are some gods that are more popular, for example, amongst the outcasts that would not be worshipped so much by, say, the rulers. Okay? There are god, for example, another thing, the goddesses are not worshipped by men. Men do not usually worship the female gods. Why? Because they're women. Men only worship male gods. The females can worship both. And a lot of times the, the women focus on the female gods. Okay. Again, 
Durkheim would see the religion as kind of simply being a projection of the society. In Indian society, women are second class, they're subservient to the men, and this is exactly how the religion is set up. The society comes first, and then the religion kind of follows along, rather than the religion coming and saying, no, 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 women don't worship male gods, or women don't worship, or excuse me, men don't worship female gods, you only worship male gods, okay? For, for Durkheim, the sacred, in his view, was anything that was forbidden, anything set apart from everyday life. Um, one could even say from societal use. Okay, It's set apart and it's forbidden. Do not touch. Do not eat. Do not go there. Okay, Those kinds of ideas. Don't touch this. Don't eat this. Don't do this. Don't go there. These are forbidden. Okay? Don't climb on that mountain. Why? It's sacred. The gods live there. You don't belong there. Okay? Don't eat this sort of food. Why? Because it's for the king, and the king is the son of God, and he's sacred. Therefore, the food is sacred. I know this because I had a Korean girlfriend, and she had a book. It was all in Korean. I wish it were in English, but I just looked at the pictures. The pictures were fascinating. It was a cookbook. It was a Korean cookbook for the royal court. And this lady, who was a young, young girl, was part of the, uh, the, uh, the royal court back when Korea, Korea at one time had a king and a queen um, until the Japanese destroyed that. The Japanese invaded and, and destroyed the, the Korean kingdom, um, this monarchy that was there. Uh, the last queen, and uh, but there were there was a particular cookbook for the royal family, and these were Korean dishes and foods that only, only royalty could eat. And I was looking at some of these pictures. I wish I could find the book again. The pictures were beautiful. These foods were fascinating. I probably wouldn't have liked a lot of them because they were, you know, was, I don't know. For me as a Westerner, they were kind of weird. Um, but the, they were beautiful, and they could only be eaten by the royal family. And this this woman had been a young girl, very young girl, as a young girl had been part of it. I guess I guess she worked in the kitchen, and somewhere along the line, as an old lady, she decided to put down from memory all of these recipes and things that they made, and they made them and 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 took pictures of them for this cookbook. Forbidden, do not eat. Do not eat. Um, do not, you know, things like, for example, uh, King Henry VIII. I remember this. King Henry VIII had this awful um, boil or infection or, um, what do you call it, sore in his leg. I think it was his left leg. And uh, his doctors were constantly draining it and stuff like that. It was very painful. And it was a weird sort of illness because it seemed that when they drained the fluid and cleaned it, it actually was more painful than when they just let it go and become, you know, with all the pus and whatnot. And it was so disgusting. It, w it was so smelly from the rot and the, and, and the, and the, and the infected flesh and whatever that um i remember that i was watching a show about on tv and they some of the doctors are people who in the first hand accounts were describing how you could smell it from the other side of the building you were in that he lit from the apartments you know and um but what was interesting was the doctors thought he w it was killing henry the eighth that he was dying from it but they could not say that no one could say that either to the king or to each other because you'd be killed you would be executed to even say even for his doctor a physician to say that i think this is an end of life event was considered treasonous like what you want the king to die you know you want the government to end it was considered treason and you could be executed for it so it was something forbidden. Even it was say, the, the the person of the king was so sacred and off limits that you could not. First of all, you didn't touch him. 
Secondly, you could not dis discuss his health, whether he was feeling bad or whether he was going to die. This idea of the forbidden, the taboo, okay, that's another a good word, and we, we use it in English, um, but taboo. You know, when we say something is taboo, oh, that's a taboo topic. Don't talk about race. You know, don't talk about sex. Don't talk about politics. These are taboo, you know. Um, this word taboo actually comes from a word which means forbidden, but I'm not going to get into that because it would take too long. Um, this idea of, excuse me, I'm going to stay on this. This idea of forbiddenness, this for... Durkheim is the distinguishing factor between the sacred and profane. The idea of something being set apart or forbidden is what defines religious thought. Okay, this idea of the taboo, of something that is forbidden from the normal everyday use, something that is sacred. So sacred and profane, This again, this idea of sacred and profane defines religious thought. If you understand it in the sense of sacred being what is forbidden and cannot be touched or talked about or done, and profane being what you can do, you know, without any repercussions. But this must be remembered that for Durkheim as an agnostic, someone who didn't really think there may be a spiritual world anyways, um, the sacred and profane do not really exist in the real world, okay? The sacred does not really exist for Durkheim. It is a creation of human society, okay? What human societies think are important. Virginity, uh, okay? Let's, let's talk about moral things, like virginity, okay? To have a woman, um, not for men, but for women especially, that a woman should be untainted by sexual contact, okay? Her hymen should be intact when she is. Why? Well, because you had to basically sell the woman for marriage. <laughs> you know, that's basically what's going on, you know? A family shows up to your, meets with your family, and the fathers meet, and they, they say, you know, my, my son wants to marry one of your daughters, um, you know, we want to basically purchase her. <laughs> so we have go. That's what, you know, what does she bring with her, you know? And if you find, and you're essentially, in a, in a way, buying her from her family. You know, she becomes part of the, fa the, the son's home. And uh, she really, truly leaves her family and never sees them again. Doesn't live with them doesn't go to visit them because she is now considered part of the family she's married into. And um, what can gum up the works or make things problematic is on the wedding night when the son goes to have sex with her and finds out that her hymen is broken or she's not a virgin, you know? She, she you know, because sometimes in some cultures they would examine the woman before the sexual act, and they might find out, you know, uh, she's been with somebody before, which may not be true. I mean, there are physical activities that women can, you know, like playing sports and stuff that can accidentally tear the hymen and um, whatever. Um, but it was a big deal to confirm that a woman had not been with another man. Hence, in cultures you have, you know, women don't go out together. You know, uh, a woman, women go out together in pairs. Um, a woman goes out, if she can't have a, have a woman with her, another woman, she goes out with a brother or an uncle. Who certainly never goes out with a, a man, another man who's not from her family because the, the, the idea is, well, why, what are they going out for? And have a role in, in things could happen. He, you know, he could rape her or she could willingly have sex with him, and then how do we marry her? She, she won't be married. We can't marry her. Um, so these are societal projections onto the world. In the modern world, we'd say, well, who cares about that? A lot of people would say, who cares? You know, so my daughter's not a virgin, so who cares? Or my son's not a virgin. He's had sex before. 
you know, that's people aren't generally shocked by that anymore. But in other cultures, at other periods of time in history, uh, not being a virgin could get you killed. Not so much for men, okay, but certainly for a woman. You are off, you're off limits. A young woman is off limits, okay? She is being held for her husband. Uh, say certain foods. You get this in certain religions like Judaism, especially associated with Judaism. But even Islam has this. Um, you find this in Islam. Even Hinduism has this. Certain prohibitions on types of foods that you should eat. Okay? A lot of times these are simply matters of culture. These are perhaps not religious, but um, these are projections onto culture. Okay, onto the culture. Um, I'd say, for example, in Hinduism, you know, well, they do not eat cows. You do not eat beef if you are a Hindu because the cow is considered a very sacred creature. Why? I, I Honestly, I don't know. I'd have to look it up. I believe it has some connection with one of the gods. Um, but nevertheless, the cow is considered so forbidden that you don't, you don't certainly don't kill it and eat it but um even if cows start you know are walking down the street uh cars have to stop and get out of their way people have to get out of their way because they're cows <laughs> you know they're sacred they're brahmin bulls you know certain foods are forbidden simply because the god says not to eat them you know i can't figure out any real reason why um why pig's flesh is forbidden to Jews. I don't know why. Other cultures eat pigs, um, but the God of the Jews told them, don't eat pigs, don't eat their flesh, because they're unclean. That doesn't mean necessarily that they're dirty animals, um, although people might think that pigs are dirty because they roll in the mud um, to get cool, to cool off, but... Um, you know, unclean in the Bible simply, simply has this sense of forbidden. That's what kosher means. To say something is kosher is, means it's, it's approved. It's approved. It, it's, it's acceptable for eating. If it's not kosher, it's forbidden. It, it's, um, I forgot the word, um, harem maybe or something. But anyways, um, I don't think I've read the whole Bible. I can't think of any place in the whole Bible where the, the God of Israel actually gives an explanation as to why pigs are unclean. They're just forbidden. There, there are certain animals, maybe because of what they do, um, they're, they're just considered off limits. For example, some of the birds, there are certain birds like vultures that Jews are forbidden to eat the flesh of. And I can understand that because they're carrion eaters. They they eat dead flesh. They eat rotten thing, rotten flesh. And for um, for the Jewish God, at least the God of Israel, um, you don't eat rot. You don't eat corpses. You don't eat corpse flesh. And because this d bird does it, it's considered disgusting. And so don't even eat the flesh of that bird. Um, why God has a doesn't want people to eat lobsters and shrimp? I don't know, <laughs> but I don't I don't know how Jewish society is projecting that onto their religion. You know, um, in the case of Islam, I think it's clearer because they don't eat uh, Muslims will not eat pig's flesh, pig's meat, just like Jews. However, they also won't drink alcohol. Whereas in Judaism, alcohol is fine, you know? In fact, alcohol is praised in the scriptures in certain places. People are also warned about it, you know, that wine can make a man a fool. But, you know, the wine was a very big part of Jewish culture and Jewish meals. Um, so maybe there we would see a projection onto their God. Their God does not forbid that, um, which is part of so much part of their culture. Whereas... I, I don't know how to what extent wine was a part of Islamic culture or the culture of the Arabian Peninsula. Um, that's something I'd have to look into. Uh, you often don't find, you know, and there might be, you don't find in the food laws 
the God, the religion forbidding something which is prevalent, you know, like something that's like, don't eat meat at all, you know, don't eat any animal flesh, you must be vegetarian. Um, in Hinduism, that is the goal. If you're a truly devout and, and um, faithful Hindu, uh, especially if you're a holy man, you, you would not eat the flesh of any animal. You would probably you be mostly vegetarian, I should say. You would be a vegetarian. You would not eat the flesh of an animal. Um, nevertheless, most Hindus are not holy men, <laughs> you know, don't live that life. So they, they eat forms, they eat chickens and, you know, they eat goats and lamb and stuff like that. I know because I eat Indian, I've eaten Indian food before. Um, so I wonder, I do wonder to what extent Durkheim might be right that there are projections of society onto their religion where the gods don't flat out forbid stuff that is ubiquitous or something that is um, really ne necessary, like forms of protein, like saying, just be vegetarian, you can't eat anything. Um, I'm not sure. I'd have, to, I'd have to look that up. I have to think about that some more. Well, I guess that's enough for now. It, I think it's been uh, two and a half hours. Uh, so God bless you, my students, and I will see you again, God willing.